Fed to cut rates until the second half of next year. The higher for longer doesn't matter to the equity markets. The rally we've seen in equities, you know, in the last three to four weeks, it's been a spectacular sort of very short rally. As we look out to next year, uh, we, we think the S&P 500 can hit 5,000 by the end of the year. The holiday rally is certainly very much in force. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get your week started live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P pulling back just a touch down by 0.1%. The S&P 500 on a four-week winning streak. TK, we've got a new target. Binky Charter, Deutsche Bank, 5,100 year-end next year. It's a 5,000 club. We're only interviewing people, folks, to the end of the year that believe in SPX 5,000. <laughs> Forget about the doom. Uh, Lori Calvacina coming up with some optimism uh, there as well. Both, I thought it was a sobering weekend where those cautious had to recalibrate. And it'll be fascinating. I have no idea what to expect here as we launch into December. We've seen a lot of this, haven't we? 5K, 5K. You mentioned Laurie Cavacina over at RBC. We'll catch up with her in about five minutes' time. Lisa, also, Savita Subramaniam over at Bank of America. Just sort of getting around this idea that maybe this S&P 500 has got something like 10% upside from here. And how much is this going to be driven by a bond rally with yields coming in because of disinflation and because of this sort of soft landing narrative versus some sort of recession that then spurs some sort of recuts that then spurs the stock market rally. With a 495 two-year yield, our yields coming in. I noticed quietly in the last five days the two-year yield is revisiting five-ish. Data point of the week last <clears throat> week, jobless claims Wednesday. Here we are talking about jobless claims starting to climb. Wondering whether we're at that inflection point where you have to start getting worried about the weakness in the labor market bank. Jobless claims going back down towards 200k, <coughs> Bramo. Looking at Black Friday, the holiday shopping, going into the weekend, Adobe Analytics saying that online things look pretty decent. This consumer yeah. holding on. Yeah, up about 7.5%, I believe, uh, year over year when you start to look at some of the consumption numbers. So here's the thing. Are we looking at a situation where everything can just moderate just enough? Or are we going to see recession delayed? Deutsche Bank, on the other side of the bank, actually projecting that they weren't wrong, they were just late, like, early, and that we're going to still get <laughs> the same kind no. of downturn. That's my favorite, downturn. But that's, that's my that we, I heard so much of that over the weekend. Yeah, but Matt Lizzetti was out front saying there's a recession, but way, way, way out. Here's Binky Chata, uh, John. Despite above-trend growth, core inflation has fallen, continued declines would return inflation to a pre-tamic range without requiring slower growth. Recession is widely anticipated and expected to be mild. Does Binky it's, whisper the recession part? The recession. Whispers L Lizzetti recession. nailed the slowdown, and he said it would be out there not soon, and I guess that's still where we are. At the Lisa Thanksgiving dinner, they were screaming recession at TK on Thursday. 100%. They don't whisper it. No. It's sort of, you know, why are people unhappy? We don't understand. <laughs> what is social media going to happen? Actually, the best was for me when one person said, you know, maybe if robots are smarter than us, maybe it's for the best. <laughs> is that actually what someone said at your dinner? Well, I, I saw it this on is where this comes from. Yeah. Uh, this is where this comes from. It, there, it goes deep. Okay. I saw it on okay. social that Lisa overcooked the Brussels sprouts. And I did. That was enough of a scandal oh, right there. You? Yeah, I did. How did you do that? I left them in for too long. It wasn't that complicated. Did you put them in the oven? Yes. Did you boil them first? No. Okay. No. So you sort of burned them, you charred them? No, charred would have been better. Okay. I just kind of so left what, them in for too long. So what long. color did they come out? Just a little... Not green anymore. <laughs> Okay. No, Martha you're, you're taught me it you take nice the bowl, you, take the so bowl you throw said sprouts in, olive oil, stir them around, salt yeah, I did pepper, that. Shallots, and you garlic. Put in, oh, nice. It started well. <laughs> and then it just left in for way too long. More on Bramo's Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> later in the program. Let's turn to the scores, the price action in financial markets to kick off your Monday scores. morning. Shaping up as follows. Your S&P 500 Jets. negative by 0.1% on the S&P. Never mind the Jets, the Patriots, Tom. Oh. Just awful. Thankful for Dolly Parton last week. What did you make of that? Just fantastic, TK. Yeah. What a performance. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Thursday lunchtime. Yeah. yeah. Just fantastic. The Giants yeah. did well. Just want to throw that out there. So, You're a Giants yeah. fan? There are Giants fans in the family. In, in the Bramo. In the, in the, yeah, okay. okay Let's good. talk about this week ahead. It's not going to be uh, with particular sports data for me. Eco data is going to be uh, Wednesday, the Fed's beige book, which yes. I'm going to read. The anecdotes are important. Thursday, we get personal income and spending data. The core PCE deflator uh, is what I am watching. 
Do we see enough disinflation to change the narrative of people who have seen their food prices climb about 30 percent uh, since 2020? This is one of the key questions. We get jobless claims, and on Friday, ISM manufacturing and auto sales. Treasury auctions, they return. Today, we get $54 billion of two-year treasuries and $55 billion of five-year notes being auctioned. Tuesday, $39 billion of seven-year notes. This has been a massive mover of the equity market. Does it continue to be? And this, you guys are all going to be very happy. Drum roll. Yeah, yeah. Fed speak is returning. Tuesday, we hear from Chicago Fed President Austin Coolsby and Fed Governor Chris Waller. Wednesday, we hear from Cleveland Fed's Loretta Mester. Friday, it's Fed Chair Jay Powell in a fireside chat along uh, with Fed Governor Lisa Cook and the Fed's Coolsby yet again. Can't wait. Proceed carefully. 50 different ways <laughs> coming up a little bit later this week. A couple yeah. of programming notes for you. Fantastic exclusive conversation with the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Francine Lacroix. We'll bring you some highlights of that a little bit later. And catching up with Blackstone, Steve Swartzman, TK, that conversation about <clears throat> 25 minutes away. Really timely. You know, there's a lot of big thing, great and worthy talk. But the real issue with him is his support of the former president. Uh, things heating up politically. We'll do a lot on that here this week uh, as well. And then also what's going on on it, his said uh, Blackstone. I, I mean, it's really interesting to me to see what the private markets like Apollo, like Blackstone, are doing into the end of the year. All of that just around the corner. We begin the program with Laurie Cavasina, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Laurie, good morning. We hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I want to kick off with your call. 5,100, 5,000 rather, year end on the S&P 500 for next year. Deutsche Bank going one further at 5,100. Laurie, talk to us about the path to 5K. Well, thanks for having me as always. And look, you know, we purposefully did not put out, you know, we see a, a near term pullback, then a resurgence. I think a lot of people got caught in that trap in 2023, calling for a near term pullback in the first quarter that didn't end up happening. Um, I do think we'll be watching our sentiment indicator very closely. It's been the best star in the sky to navigate the equity market this year, but it's also round tripped a couple times. It started out giving you a screaming buy signal because of deep pessimism, returned to that post SVB, gave a sell signal in August, and then gave a a buy signal again in November. So I think we're going to have to just be very tactical in that. You know, I have been telling people November is very consistently a strong month, but December is a little bit more hit or miss. So we'll see if we end up getting the Santa or Grinch in December. Um, but I do think the path for equities is higher next year. And if we do have a bit of a short term pullback, either in December or to start the year, I expect it to be temporary. Lori, uh, Goldman Sachs had a note. Uh, thanks, Zero Hedge, for this on sales growth looking out two years, 23, 24, 25. And the difference between the Magnificent Seven with 11% sales growth versus the SPX 493 up 3% sales growth. Why would anybody sell the Magnificent Seven right now? I think it's a great question, Tom. When we look at our indicators and we look at the mega cap growth trade broadly, it looks crowded. If you look at the weekly CFTC data on NASDAQ 100 futures positioning, we're basically close to peak valuation and growth relative to value. If you look at the Russell 1000 on a weighted PE multiple, which is going to be very heavily influenced by that magnificent seven. And if you look at earnings momentum, we're still seeing better earnings revision trends in growth and value, but value is starting to catch up a little bit. Um, so we are seeing that leadership on the earnings side fade a little bit. All of that tells me that there should be a pause in growth leadership at some point. But I think one of the reasons people can't really permanently quit these growth stocks is, you know, kind of hitting on exactly what you said, the idea that there will be superior growth there over the intermediate term. And if you look at GDP forecasts for next year, 1% in real terms anticipated by the street, 1.8% in 2025, when we're in a sub 2% GDP environment, growth stocks usually do outperform because economic growth is perceived to be scarce. Um, so I do think there is a real tension. You know, we still like the tech sector, even though we have these shorter term tactical concerns on growth. Had those tactical concerns on growth, frankly, for a while, and they've yet to really materialize in a big way. And I do feel like you may need to see a real ratcheting up of GDP expectations before you can really see growth lose some of that leadership dominance. When you talk about sentiment and how really that's been the lodestone for you. It's figuring out where is investor sentiment and betting against it. Am I correct? Basically, you know, one of the things I've learned over my career, Lisa, is that when everybody is really, really pessimistic, that's usually a fantastic time to buy. If you look at when the AAII uh, net bullishness indicator is, you know, sort of one standard deviation or two standard deviations below the long term average, I forget the exact stat, but it's in the 80s in terms of the percent of time that you're up 12 months later. And you see similar stats if you look on the flip side when people are overly enthusiastic. Now, if you're above one standard deviation on extreme optimism, you still tend to see like a five 
5% gain over the next 12 months. So it's not necessarily a washout, but it does tell you that you tend to see consolidation. You do tend to see some choppier markets. And I think that's why it's so important, Lisa, to really prioritize data over narratives. I know a lot of strategists like to tell a great story and then they go out and put together their charts to try to fit whatever narrative they're pushing out there. But I really think that you have to stick to the data and things like that sentiment indicator will keep you into falling into consensus traps. Um, again, when, when thing, everybody just sort of gloms onto the same narrative and things get too extreme. Well, the narrative that we've been hearing again and again is 5,000 on the S&P going into next year, at least uh, if not more. And there has been a sort of boom in optimism that we've seen. Does that mean it's time to start taking some chips off the table and to be a little bit less optimistic? Or does this mean that finally you might see some of that cash uh, at record levels going into the equity market? Well, it's interesting, Lisa. You know, everybody wants to sort of talk about this idea, and this is maybe on the more bearish side of the table, that bonds look more attractive than stocks and the earnings yield has collapsed relative to the bond yield. And all that is true, but if you actually go back, there have been periods in history when equity investors or investors in general have taken up both their equity allocations and their bond allocations at the same time. So I don't think it's unheard of for both to do well. You know, 5,000, it's starting to be a number we're hearing a lot. I think we were maybe the second person on the sell side that had it when we put ours out, but you are starting to hear about it. And I think 10% is usually a reasonable place that a lot of strategists start. Um, we do have one model that can take us up to 5,300, and that's yes. looking at our valuation work and earnings work. And I will tell you, Lisa, like, and I, as I was putting the report together, you always think about kind of where did you go wrong in the past year? I was more optimistic than most, but not optimistic in the end. And that valuation model was the one thing that was telling me all year to look for 4,700, 4,800 on the S&P. It's pointing to 4,700 on the end of the year now for 2023. At one point it was saying 48, 49. Um, so I do think you have to have a little bit of humility when you look at these forecasts. We look at a bunch of different models. We take the median. Some are more constructive, some are less. Um, but I do think we do have to pay attention to that bull oh. case heading into next year because so that's Jeff, really what worked this year. Does that mean a banner, Calvacina says 5,300? I think we can go there. No. Not quite. I think we're sticking no. with 5K. Laurie, I just <laughs> wanted to jump in. When you were putting this together, surely 5K was yeah. something like 20% upside at the time. So, you know, John, I, I started back in October pricing the models, and we actually published a report in October where we said, we're not going to do our target yet, but here's what all the models are showing. And back then we were getting, you know, a more a little bit of a more subdued number because we had a lower starting point. So we did price everything as of mid-November. I think a lot of our models we froze as November 15th, November 16th. Um, so we really are kind of getting sort of a true 10% from current conditions as of mid-November. Basically, when I do this, John, I go into a black hole for a few days, don't answer my phone, <laughs> don't answer email, and don't talk to anybody and update all at once. So well, That's welcome sort of back out of the black hole, Laurie. We're happy to see you. Laurie Cavasina, uh, RBC Capital Markets, looking for 5K year-end next year. Big mystery for us over the last week, the state of the U.S. consumer. I want to go back to jobless claims in America, coming back down towards 200K. Last week, we had some retailers, the likes of Best Buy, saying things looking out to the end of the year, not great. Then we've got this from Adobe Analytics, Lisa, that, as you indicated, sales were up by 7.5% compared with last year online on Black Friday, the number 9.8% billion dollars. What is it right now? The conflicting signals you're getting from corporations or just the raw hard data that you see in jobless claims? Honestly, this is the tricky thing. Is it specific items? Is it specific jobs that are driving these things? I'm thinking of the online sales that conflict with other data that came out that showed a much more modest increase of about two and a half percent. And that was tied more to the brick and mortar, feet on the ground kind of retail stores right. that are more tied to the non-electronic goods. So are we just continuing to see that divergence of the leadership of everyone spending every spent they have I watched too Apple. much college football this weekend, which is helpful if you want to get away from New York City. And I'm going to overlay a prosperous America, John, with Neil Dutta's rising real incomes. The real issue here is even across all of our societal structure, we've got a lower inflation making for a better income. True. It's good to be back, TK. Yeah, it's nice like to good. be around family this Monday all, morning. Yeah, you know. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research, bullish this there. equity market. Coming up in the next hour, futures pulling back a tenth of 1% from New York. Good morning. Critically needed aid is going in and hostages are coming out. And this deal is structured so that it can be extended to keep building on these results. That's my goal, that's our goal, to keep this pause going beyond tomorrow. 
so that we can continue to see more hostages come out and surge more humanitarian relief into, into those in, who in need in Gaza. The President of the United States speaking over the weekend as a pause in the Israel-Hamas war allowed for the release of hostages from Gaza. More on that story in just a moment. If you are back with us, welcome back. Your equity market on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. The scores look like this. We're negative by 0.1% on the S&P. On a 10-year in the Treasury market, 4.46%. 65. Here's the call from Deutsche Bank. We mentioned Binky Charter looking for 5,100 on the S&P year-end next year. Here's the call from Jim Reed and David Falkertz Lando looking ahead to next year. Lisa, a mild U.S. recession in the first half of 2024. So there's Binky saying 5,100 on the S&P, which is more than 10% upside from where we are right now on the benchmark in America. And here's the economics team saying recession in early 24. And Binky kind of bends this around by saying it's going to be a soft recession and that's probably what's going to get us to new highs and we're going to bring rates down so it's going to help fuel uh, even more gains. But there is this question <coughs> of whether people are just pushing back the calls that they had last year to next year, right? So it was didn't happen in 2023. Is it going to happen in 2024? I do wonder about that because there are some pretty aggressive rate cutting calls from that same Deutsche Bank team as well, including 100 basis points of cuts over at the ECB. Are you saying they just edit last year's outlook no, because for next year? I, I actually have an incredible amount of respect for just them. Just change the think, data. Well, I don't think it's quite that simple, but there is still this idea that we have the same pathway. It's just that the time frame has shifted. I, I, the time frame has shifted. They're redoing and what they're redoing to is revenue growth and earnings and corporations adapting. I would take it away from all the macro babble. Focus Landau is wonderful because he looks for fiscal stimulus because there's two wars. But, you know, the, the answer here is I would look at the micro, which is people earning money, corporations adapting. And that leads me to where there's a cumulative 2024 where the Magnificent Seven continue. And yet to be. people feel absolutely terrible about this economy. It's just terrible. I went over it's this terrible. Empower Outlook, Tom, this Empower poll on what Americans need to be happy. <clears throat> In this country, oh, how much the amount of income work? needed. How much they Don't need get to me work. going. Okay, what do you think they need? What, what do you think they need on average? Well, we were looking for thirty-eight thousand a few years ago. Two hundred and eighty-four thousand one hundred and sixty-seven dollars a year. That's on average. Go by demographic. Let's go by age group. Millennials, Tom. Do you know what millennials think they need? Five hundred and twenty-five thousand U.S. dollars. A number that isn't too far south from the number that you would need to get into the top one percent of income earners in this country. You want to know why people are unhappy, TK? because a lot of people aren't earning the money they think they need to be happy in this country because things are so expensive. Try buying a house, raising a family. Well, that's the a price key. Of things raising a family is a key here. And on a societal basis, and I wonder if this will be an election issue, is the idea of children or no children. Because what's really metered off the pandemic is having children, and particularly young, ill-mannered children, uh, is, you know, <laughs> is, is this sport as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get personal, but, you know. The children. I found it's, those numbers absolutely <clears throat> staggering. Absolutely yeah. staggering. It's 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 always been there, but I do admit it's it's worse now than it's been. We're going to continue here on a Monday. Joining us now with some great visibility in recent days with Bloomberg Television and Radio is Bobby Ghosh. She's with Bloomberg Opinion, but far more of that with Time Magazine, earned experience in Baghdad and of course in the greater Middle East as well. We're thrilled we could get an update uh, this morning. What is the Western media getting wrong right now? All weekend, I saw a hostage update, hostage update. It's like we've almost forgotten about the war. Yes, we have. And the people who haven't forgotten are Israel's military commanders. They're still, they've still got their eyes on, on the goal that Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, set immediately after the terrorist attacks of October 7th, which is destroy Hamas completely. Can that actually be done? That's a question for a longer debate, but that's still the goal. And for them, this uh, truce of four days is an interruption of right. military operations. They're keen to resume military operations with that goal in mind. And, and on, whereas there's a lot of international discussion about extending the troop, we just saw that clip of President Biden saying he'd like the troop to be ex the truce to be extended. Israel military commanders want to get back to the fighting because they know they have to sooner or later. I've been dying to talk to you about one question I have, and you lived this like no one with an extended tenure in Baghdad. You didn't have TikTok. No. You didn't have social media. You didn't have the immediate visibility of this horror that we've seen. 
could, could we have done any of the past stuff with the social media we have now? How does it change the present discussion as well? Well, it changes the optics for the politicians. They, they become much more keenly aware of public opinion in the way that they weren't. I mean, 23 years ago, my, one of my first, um, ex my first exposure to a Middle Eastern war was during the Second Intifada in the West Bank, in Janine. Um, at that time, politicians could sort of block out the noise, if you like, of public opinion and make decisions um, based on political priorities, but also military and strategic considerations. What social media does is that it, it prevents you from blocking off information. And particularly politicians like Benjamin Netanyahu, who are, who are populists, who've always been populists, who care very much for public opinion. That combination of someone who cares that much and the public opinion being so visible makes muddies the water. It, it, it makes decision-making much murkier than it might have been before. Help us build on that, just in terms of public opinion, domestically speaking. Yeah. Who's under more pressure to extend the ceasefire now? The President of the United States or the Israeli Prime Minister? Well, the Israeli Prime Minister, because the President of the United States is speaking to him directly and saying, extend the truce. If you're the President, Prime Minister of Israel, you can't really ignore the President of the United States. He is your most important backer in, as world opinion grows more and more against Israel in this conflict, the, the, having the President of the United States behind you becomes more and more important. So Netanyahu is going to really struggle with this decision. On the one hand, no, no lesser person than Joe Biden speaking directly to him and speaking directly to the world is saying, I want this truce extended. And then on the other side, you have these military commanders saying, you extend this truce, you're giving Hamas more time to regroup. You extend this truce, it becomes difficult for us, even sort of optically and politically, to get back into the fight. There's a lot in a statement, particularly from this president. Over the weekend, when he says things like that, mm. can you conclude that he is losing the will to support the military activities of Israel? Well, there have been lots of little bits of, uh, lots of hints and suggestions of that. Uh, whereas the is that the right interpretation of what he said over the weekend? I think that is. I, and it's not that it was just one soundbite. For, for days now, for a couple of weeks now, the White House has been quietly briefing journalists on background to say that they're really anxious about a few things. Uh, the fact that Israel seems to be going in too hard and there's, there, there's too much collateral damage among civilians in, in Gaza. They've been really concerned that Israel, more than a month, 50 days into this conflict now, Israel has not yet communicated what's going to happen the day after. There's no day after plan. And with every passing day, it becomes harder and harder to excuse that. And the, and the White House is really anxious that Netanyahu has not told them what he has in in his mind for what comes after the fighting stops. Israel has said that they will continue the truce for every day that Hamas produces 10 or more yeah. uh, hostages and transfers them over. Do we have a sense of how much pressure Hamas is under from Qatar, which has been negotiating uh, at a time where perhaps the dial is shifting a little bit against them as well? Well, Israel said it might extend. It, it has not said for certain that it will. It, it says that this offer is on the table. And again, we heard Netanyahu there in that clip saying it's a blessed, well, it's a blessing to have that option. But he hasn't committed himself. He's been very careful about that. Hamas benefits from every day of extension that it can get, right? It, it, its soldiers have, its fighters have taken a real battering. Um, it's the, the, the infrastructure that it has, its arms supplies, its cap capacity to build more arms uh, has taken a severe battering. So every day uh, that it can get, uh, it will very happily take. Uh, is there pressure from Qatar and, and also Egypt and others? Yes, there is. Um, there's, we've also seen, and it's hard to know because it's impossible to conduct polling in a place like Gaza in the best of times, and certainly not in the middle of a war, but there have been, there's some anecdotal evidence that ordinary Palestinians are, are pushing back against Hamas, not content simply to blame the Israelis, but also saying, well, Hamas is partly responsible for our predicament. Bobby. Appreciate the update. Thank Anything. you, sir. Bobby Ghosh of Bloomberg Opinion. More on those developments out of the Middle East through this morning. Coming up next, Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone sitting down with Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua from New York City this morning. Good morning.
Four weeks of gains on the S&P 500. Believe it or not, the longest weekly winning streak going back to June on the S&P 500. Equity futures look like this on the S&P, on the Nasdaq. We're negative by 0.1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, down about a tenth of 1% as well. The Russell of small caps all over the place. We're down about a half of 1%, negative by 0.46%. Getting a ton of outlooks from Wall Street. Top of the pile, Deutsche Bank, Binky Charter. 5,100 on the S&P. Throw in Laurie Calvacina from earlier this morning. RBC, 5K. Right. Bank of America, Savita Subramaniam, 5K. Tom, consensus, is it starting to coalesce around this view that we've got upside of high single digits, low double digits next year? Yeah, there's no question about that. But the bias here is to study those that nailed 2023. Granted, it all happened in the last six weeks. Bikram Chada did that. He's been bullish throughout the year. John Stolfus, another one. There's, there's, there's a, it's, it's, it's a nice group of people that nailed this, but they nailed it right at the end. So I got to pay more attention to why Binky Chada continues bullish versus others that are catching up. Well, Goldman Sachs seems to agree, too. Everyone seems to be bullish heading into next year. The reasons for why are what are, what are diff so different, right? Is it because we have an economy that keeps chugging along and stocks can keep eking out uh, the returns of corporations led by the Magnificent Seven or the Magnificent One, if you're just looking at NVIDIA? Uh, or is this something that is on the heels of a shallow downturn? And, and sort of that's what's interesting to me is the daylight between the rationale all getting to the same place. I think you have to remember, if you told us at the start of the year that rates would be through 5%, the jobless claims would still be close to 200K, the unemployment toll would be south of four, and we'd have these disinflationary trends going into year end. I think a lot of people would say, keep dreaming, love it, let's buy stocks. But that's been the story, Tom the year so far. Now, this can be a moment in time and not the ultimate destination. I understand all of that. We could talk about where we're going to go in 2024. But, Tom, that's what's evolved in 2023. The great underestimation of 70 percent of the economy, the American consumer. I got a P.E. on Walmart rounded up 29. Even with earnings growth next year, Walmart 25. I don't think anyone, including the bulls, estimated we would see multiple expansion like that in something growing at a single digit level. So this is how the conversation goes on Wall Street at the <coughs> moment. Give me a price target on the S&P for next year. Follow up question. How many cuts are you looking for in the next 12 months? Let's turn to the bond market. Two year, 10 year, 30 year. I would say jobless claims last week helping keep this two year pinned close to 5 percent. Four ninety four forty on a two year this morning. Ten year, four forty seven. Thirty year, four sixty. Way off the cycle highs of the last couple of months or so. We were at 5% plus on a 10-year, yeah. only a few weeks back. The two-year at about 525, 526, so well off cycle highs at the moment. But here is a rate cut call from Deutsche Bank. 175 basis points of Fed cuts Jesus. in 2024. Lisa, 175. That is pretty deep. And we've heard something similar from UBS, right, where they came out and they expect pretty aggressive rate cutting next year. Is this because of a severe recession? No, it's cosmetic cuts, which is somehow going to enter the lexicon. And we've heard this before, which is essentially that if you end up with slower growth, then just de facto, you have a more restrictive rate. So you can cut rates even if you haven't gotten some sort of severe downturn. This is really the key question. Is there a conflict between economic data, including jobless claims, coming in better than expected and the expectation that the Fed will be able to cut rates? This is really going to be the reason why I'm watching this. And to me, it's data deflator, dependency uh, as well. I mean, you look at the Fed game, Jan, and I'm sorry, I go back to data dependency. Second look GDP, we're looking for an increase on survey to 5.0 percent. Third quarter GDP, go to the deflator with a continued disinflation. Go to what you love, ISM manufacturing, a more optimistic survey statistic, pretty gloomy but more optimistic. And then you go into the jobs report, uh, which is coming up on uh, bu 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 uh, December 8th. Next Friday. Yeah. Not this Friday, next Friday. Yeah. And you go into the jobs report, and I'm, I have to wait for all that data to reassess. 175 basis points of Fed cuts and 0.6% GDP expected in 2024. Deutsche Bank's <coughs> outlook. Let's finish on foreign exchange. The euro is shaping up as follows against the dollar. Euro dollar positive by about 0.1%. Let's call it 109.50. We talked about Fed cuts. Looking for some ECB cuts as well next year over at Deutsche Bank. They're talking about 100 basis points from June to year end yeah, I'm 2024.
Yeah, well, I mean, to me, it makes sense if you're talking about stagflation. Although, the problem is, can they cut? And this really, again, we haven't been talking about inflation. And if you look at longer-term inflation expectations, they've actually come in close to where the Fed is expecting it to be. The recent rate volatility has been something else I, than just pure inflation. I would suggest that the data dependency in Europe is even more key than here, overlay, uh, overlaid by the political bombshells, John, including the vote in the Netherlands, which I think has cl clearly been underplayed in the American media. Do you think we've conquered the bond market volatility, some smaller moves? Last week, I, I, not it's a holiday on week. I don't yeah. know what to say about it, but <clears throat> well, I'll give you a holiday moves. week. I mean, I come in here and I look at the screen because I was I had eight days off. It's like a mini sabbatical. Is that what and it felt like? Yeah, Euro yen here is weakened back out. We're not through to yen weakness, but you know, in the global litmus paper where Americans are, you know, I'm I'm looking at, you know, what did Michigan do? I thought the Ohio State was actually pretty good. But did you, you know, watch that game? I watched I watched some of it. Okay. Yeah, I like the punter from Michigan. He kept putting the ball. I don't take you as a college football kind of guy. No, I'm not. You okay, know, but. Watch the tots I lose. So. I mean, it was, you know. Yeah, it was a bad game. Bad game. And I watched Formula One in Dubai. I was like, all TV this weekend. And the answer is, you know, you sum it all up, and the yen's weakening back out, which is a global tendency towards disinflation. I don't know how you got back towards the uh, Japanese yen, but OK. Yeah. That's the price yeah. action under surveillance this morning. Pressure growing for Israel to extend the ceasefire in its war with Hamas. The four-day pause has led to the release of 58 hostages, as well as allowing for aid to flow into Gaza. President Biden said he supports prolonging the pause, which is due to end tomorrow morning. While Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said an extension was possible. Lisa, we've been building on this through this morning. How much daylight is there between the President of the United States and what he'd like to see, what he supports, and what his own party supports right now? in this country? It seems like quite a bit. And it's a very difficult sort of needle, the thread for him at a time where he's pledged support. He backed away from uh, saying that he wanted conditions <clears throat> placed on aid to Israel, even though members of his own party have come out with specific prescriptions for what kinds of conditions they want placed on that money. This, to me, is going to be an evolving tension, which just heightens the reason to possibly prolong the ceasefire politically for his own sake. It just to me, it reminds me of 1979. And, and Iran and Jimmy Carter and, and, and the rest, we just stagger day by day with hostage news. And as Bobby Ghost just told us, he said, there's the Israeli military forces. What are they doing, twiddling their thumbs? I mean, I don't, I don't get how you juxtapose the two against each other. Looking at Cruz, you wouldn't have a clue this is happening. <clears throat> 74 yeah. WTI. Well said. Elisa Brent Cruz, yeah. 79, 56. We're down again today by a little more than 1%. And some people are saying that even if at the delayed OPEC Plus meeting they end up uh, affecting more cuts, you're still going to see a decline in oil prices. The why is going to be key, especially at a time where people are talking about a soft landing. That's the latest in the commodity market and what's happening in the Middle East. Let's turn to the online shopping and Black Friday records. According to Adobe Analytics, 9.8 billion US dollars spent online in America, with consumers leaning on buy now, pay later options. Lisa, we'll talk about that in a moment. Demand for electronics, TVs, audio equipment were particularly popular, helping boost online sales by 7.5% from a year ago. So these numbers contrast big time with what Best Buy was guiding us towards going into year end. And then I start to read about buy now, pay later, and it does make you a little bit nervous as to how much people are extending themselves going into the holiday shopping season. You called that a long time ago. You said, is this going to be the end of some of the luxury boom if you get uh, the end of the buy now, pay later? And it turns out we haven't gotten the end of it, which maybe money's the waters a little bit. How long can people keep doing this if interest rates are going up to such a degree? It's a key question, especially as credit card uh, delinquencies tick up. You start to see defaults picking up. You start to see total outstanding debt picking up. You know, we're coming from a low base. This is what people say. We don't have an overly leveraged consumer. Things look okay. But at what point don't they? <clears throat> this consumer's just about holding on, just about holding on. Third and final story for you. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak denying his economic plans will put a squeeze on public spending. However, the country's fiscal watchdog says the PM's plans for tax cuts are funded largely by a £19 billion reduction in the real value of government spending. Speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix over the weekend, Sunak denying UK austerity is on the cart. I think any a commentary or accusation that that's what's happening is just simply unfounded. Government's already spending a lot of people's money and what we need to see going forward is more productivity out of the public sector, it needs to match what we've seen in the private sector post-COVID and I'd rather focus on efficiency in the public sector and prioritise cutting people's taxes rather than the government spending ever more of their money. Difficult to make the case for austerity 
Tom, given, oh. given the amount of spending we've seen. I mean, if it's a relative game, of course, anything looks like austerity relative to the spending boom we had in the yes. West through the pandemic and out the other side. I mean, call it whatever you want, but if you're coming off that base, Bramo, surely anything less. Are we going to call that austerity, really? I mean, there seems to be a clear movement toward continuing the spending of the pandemic. That is the pressure. And to me, that's notable, right. whether it's Germany or whether the, it's Francine the UK. Francine absolutely nailed it with this question. This is the question going into next year. And it does frame out to all the enthusiasm of, say, Binky Chata and 5,100. 5, the tone by governments, particularly in Europe, John, are they going to be austere? We saw how that failed. Are they going to be, the perception is irresponsible, like U.S. stimulus? That's the arch question into the election in November. Is it austerity, Tom, though, <clears throat> to pair back from the spending that we saw? In the pandemic, no, is that I, what we're I don't think it? so. Well, I would take it on a real basis, nominal basis. Are you going to cut spending, but still increase real spending? Or are you going to actually bite in the great fear and cut inflation-adjusted spending? And that goes back to uh, a, a, the, a history of the United Kingdom. Right now, joining us, and this is a good place to pick up with Carl Weinberg, chief economist, managing director, high frequency economics. Carl, what have we learned about austerity? Did it work last time around? Well, uh, fiscal deficits are as big as they've ever been. Public sector debt is higher than it's ever been before. So austerity is um, not really a long suit of governments, especially governments heading into elections. Uh, the UK plan was, as uh, you both were just talking about, uh, a mixed bag of uh, things for the economy. Uh, there's a very public and visible cut in the national uh, health insurance uh, contributions. That's going to make people happier, even though it will only put a few pounds per week in the pockets of people. It's hard to say early in the morning. Um, but uh, it's one of these, uh, it's like the, the consumer spending in the United States right now. It's a buy now, pay later. The revenues to cover all of this aren't going to show up for a year or two. And in the meantime, there are elections. So the UK budget style is to buy some votes now and to pay for them later. Carl, I, I look at your research note, and I believe you're not going to give us a point estimate on Standard & Poor's 500 at one year, but you can certainly look at the global rate structure. If we have disinflation, do we have a lower regime of interest rate yield, and do we get back to where we were 2019? Well, Tom, when I think about the prospects for 2024, I think I see inflation coming down to or even below target in most of the countries that I'm talking, that I'm, that I'm covering right now. Uh, certainly by the end of the year, we're below target in most places. And by the first quarter of the year, we're very close to target in most places. That should, that decline in inflation, should be what prompts central banks <laughs> to take their foot off of the brakes and to even cut interest rates a few times. I don't think they're worried about recession. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to cause a recession. But they're worried about causing a really, really big recession. And that could happen if they let real interest rates rise. So falling inflation leads to a lower interest, nominal interest rate regime, but not necessarily a lower real interest rate regime. Carl, there is this concern that what's been driving a lot of the volatility in, in Treasuries has not been inflation expectations, which actually, at least when you look at Fed funds futures and if you take a look at uh, you know the five-year five-year forward break-even rates they're pretty much in line with where the Fed wants uh, it to be over the next five to ten years this is driven by something else including the fiscal backdrop so at what point can the Fed materially ease longer term rates if borrowing does continue if the idea of austerity is anything less than the spending uh, to John's point that we saw during the pandemic so, Lisa, lots of good questions. Um, you know, the market is volatile right now because nobody really knows what to do or what to expect. Are we going into a recession or not? There are good arguments on either side. Inevitably, we will have a recession. How bad will it be? What will the policy response to it be? Is Europe and the UK with their monetary corsets strapping tighter every month? Are they going to have a worse recession or a better recession? There's just a lot of uncertainty in the markets. But let's separate the markets from the economy, which is what the Fed is primarily focused on, along with all the other central banks. When we look at the economies, the central banks are looking to achieve their inflation objectives. And once they're achieved, yes, they can start backing down. And that's not to say that they are insensitive to the business cycle. But remember that all of their mandates are inflation first. And I think that's what we should look to to drive policy in the new year. Will cuts be stimulative for risk assets? 
Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, risk assets, you know, involve assessing risk, and, and that's half the equation. It's not just all about, um, you know, what, what the interest rate is. Uh, I think that um, the rate cuts will make it an easier environment for investors. It will put a lot of people in the markets on more familiar territory. They'll build confidence that the Fed and the other central banks are not out there right. to, to kill the markets, to kill the economies. <clears throat> so, yeah, I think it'll help. Carl, I saw a chart over the weekend of the gross outperformance of United States equities versus international stocks over the last decade, whatever it's been. You own the high ground on this with your experience in international finance. Do you have any way to change from American exceptionalism over to international equity performance, over to international uh, finance performance, or is it still U.S. first? So, Tom, what I'm going to say is so incredibly wrong that I can't believe I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say it anyhow, all right, which is to say that the U.S. economy is outperforming the rest of the world by a country mile. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised to see that equities are outperforming equities of other countries by that same country mile. That's not to say that GDP growth and economic performance are the only thing that are driving stocks, but the contribution of the economy to equity markets has been so much stronger in the United States than anywhere else that it's got to be making a difference. And on our forecast at high frequency economics, that's going to continue into the new year. We have a deep recession uh, on our outlook for Europe for the United Kingdom. We have muddling along for Japan or probably continued contraction. Canada is at least stalled and possibly worse depending on what happens to commodity prices and immigration. We have population uh, and labor force size constraining growth everywhere in the world, including here, but we're in a stronger place because of our higher productivity. So yeah, it's not surprising that the U.S. is doing better right now, and we're expecting that's going to continue at least into the first half of next year. But I'll add that it all hinges on productivity, and that is something that is impossible to forecast. But Carl, you're great at this. A lot of people might say that the outperformance over the last 12, 18 months, 24 months for the U.S. economy was driven by one-off factors like fiscal boosts that are going to fade going into next year and beyond. Carl, what would you say to those people? Well, the U.S. economy is going to fizzle. We're not going to have another third quarter in the fourth quarter. And the early part of next year is going to look worse. You know, fiscal drag, if you want to call it that, the withdrawal of fiscal stimulus from the pandemic, that's still going on. The reduction of people's cash balances in real and nominal terms that they built up during the pandemic, that's going to be gone. Higher interest rates, they're going to take their toll inevitably. Uh, so, yeah, you know, uh, a lot of things that we saw in this past year are not going to be around in the next year. We're convinced that high-frequency economics that we're going to see a slowdown of the U.S. economy. We're not convinced that that has to be a recession, and we're certainly not convinced that, convinced that that has to be a recession, like the last two that we saw in the U.S., which were exceptional because they also were crises. A normal slowdown and recession would be, as the name implies, normal right now. Carl, do you get the sense or do you buy into this idea of a job full recession, essentially, uh, that companies will be <clears throat> hoarding labor to avoid what they experienced during the downturn in the pandemic and that that will actually help buffer some of the uh, slowdown that you're talking about? Lisa, that's a great way to describe one aspect of the most important aspect of our situation right now, which is that we are at full employment, give or take a little bit. Pretty much everybody in this economy who wants a job has a job. And what that means is people should be happier than they are. I don't know why they're not. But secondly, all right, it means that we can't grow that fast because we don't have idle workers to put to work to make the economy grow. So barring a surge of immigration, which seems unlikely, barring a sudden arrival of babies from outer space, which seems impossible, right, we're constrained by our growth of productivity as to how fast we can grow. So sure, companies are going to be hoarding labor because labor is scarce. It's not clear to me that that's that's a bad thing, but it certainly right. is one way of getting into the subject of why can't we grow at two, three, four, five percent? And that's because we don't have the workers to do it. Carl, over the weekend, and you know, I lose track over four days, uh, you know, you know, like everybody else, the black market peso in Argentina went through a thousand. It's a thousand to one, folks. That's just a horrendous devaluation of the Argentine experience. Carl, you lived this like four disasters ago. What do we do about Argentina? How does the U.S. help the IMF 
help the Argentinians who don't want to help themselves. <laughs> well, first of all, like you, I'll freely admit that I'm still in a turkey stupor and I haven't read it on Argentina yet this morning. So thank you for giving me an update on the situation. Um, this cycle is something we've seen before, all right? Inflation, devaluation, devaluation feeds inflation, inflation feeds devaluation, and they're in it. It's going to take extreme fiscal and monetary policy. That would certainly be the advice that the IMF is giving them right now. <clears throat> And of course, one of the reasons that Argentina is in this situation is that historically, over decades, they have resisted this kind of advice and maintained that kind of discipline only for a short period of time. So I'm not an expert on the Argentine situation, but from what you tell me, it sounds to me like things are progressing into a, another dark spiral. It's TK, okay. what do you mean they don't want to help themselves? There's been a mean? cultural thing here, and it's a sensitive issue. You talk to Gita Gopinath, the Gurgiev, and the others, they're experts at IMF as well. These are big, big numbers. They're talking about helping Argentina, and there's other nations as well, not just Argentina. But they got to want to help themselves. They got to want to change the almost psychological calculus after experiment after experiment. I mean, the devaluation here of the black market, John, from the beginning of the pandemic is from 100 to a thousand. Yeah, the shocking numbers. Down, the shock. Look at inflation. They're like as Steve well. Hankey down at Johns Hopkins. I mean, but given everything you've just said, haven't they just voted for a guy that wants to make those massive cuts to the government? He said, but is, is he, is he going to amend as the guy in the Netherlands is already amending from his stridency of election? Is this guy going to, you know, change the dollarization debate? If some people think maybe he softened <clears> his stance on that. There was one individual that yeah. was lined up to be the head of the central bank, Bramo. I believe that individual has stepped back because there are some questions about how quickly some of this effort. I mean, I mean, Carl's forward. completely so, yeah, unprepared. He's bit. in a turkey stupor. I mean, you know. He, Carl, we've got to say thank you. <laughs> Carl Weinberger, high frequency <laughs> economics, just had no idea that Argentina question time was coming. Why would he? You know, well, because it's over the weekend. The look, I think, look, I think, Mille, I think <laughs> the, the question with Mille in Argentina, yeah, maybe he's Kylie softening Mille. his stance, yeah. maybe. But to me, I think it's more fascinating. What does the IMF do with 30 exactly. plus billion dollars of loans that they need to get paid back? Let's turn to the price action and get you some scores. We're shaping up as follows this Monday morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Negative here by 0.16%. Pulling back just a touch. Laurie Cavacino of RBC saying we can get to 5K. Biggie Chart of Deutsche Bank saying 5,100 by year end next year. A lot to look forward to over the next 18 months. Standing by with a special guest is Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. Thank you so much. We are delighted to be joined by Steve Schwartzman, of course, of Blackstone. Steve, thank you. You were just on stage with the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. How much are you putting in the UK? What are you most excited about when it comes to UK growth? Well, we've been putting a lot of money into the UK. First of all, we're doing our headquarters building here, which is a very significant size building. It will be the largest built in the Mayfair area in the last several decades. Um, we bought uh, two companies in the last two weeks uh, in the United States, in the UK, uh, and um, you know we we have a total of uh, 70 billion pounds. That's close to 90 million, 90 billion dollars of investments uh, in the UK, with 37,000 people working uh, in these companies in real estate. Steve, what stands out as, as the biggest strength actually for the UK? Because there are many questions. There, there was an autumn statement. We're not uh, sure how they're going to fund some of the tax cuts if they continue down the road. And we don't know if the Conservatives are in power in 12 months. Well, the big advantages of the UK uh, are the English language, uh, the rule of law. Uh, they have a terrific uh, university system. Uh, they have uh, great uh, life science uh, areas. They're the number one uh, tourist uh, uh, area uh, in Europe, which, which actually I, I found surprising. Uh, and, and so they have a lot of pockets uh, of strength. Uh, they've been through a complex time uh, uh, politically. Uh, but if you look longer term, uh, the rule of law uh, in, in the UK is very strong. Their regulatory posture has been uh, quite consistent. Uh, over time, but we forget that these are good things, uh, and not all places in the world uh, have them. Uh, and, and so I think um, I'm not a 
expert on UK, uh, you know, sort of laws in the sense of what they're doing politically. I think their autumn statement uh, on balance, which was stimulative, uh, is a good and necessary thing uh, for their economy. Uh, and they have a much more open approach uh, to uh, immigration at the top levels uh, of education, uh, which is good for helping to power uh, an economy. Uh, so so I, I think there are some interesting things going on here. Um, Steve, what can you tell us about private market valuations at PE firms? So in general, can, do you see LPs actually demanding more information on marks and more you know, reporting requirements on valuation? Is that something that's shifting? I, I don't see a big uh, uh, set of uh, enormous concerns uh, on that. Uh, what always happens at this stage in the cycle, uh, you know, when you go to very high interest rates uh, and, and the world sort of starts slowing down, uh, is that uh, deals slow down. So for LPs, their biggest concern is they're not getting capital flows back uh, that they normally were depending on because people uh, aren't, aren't selling assets. Uh, this, these type of cycles always end and things return uh, to normal. It's, it's quite interesting uh, that, um, you know, we, we just did two deals in the UK in the last two weeks, one in the affordable uh, uh, in what they call social housing area, one in computer software. Uh, b both are million, billion uh, dollar, uh, two billion dollar type uh, deals. Uh, we, we, we're doing a number of things in the U.S. now, some of which have been announced, some of which haven't. Uh, we just were involved with a situation in Norway that's $12 billion. So, so the deal business is, is not totally in mothballs, uh, and, and these things start again. Uh, and I think we're more on that side of the uh, cycle, although it has been you know, somewhat dreary uh, uh, for a year. But so in terms, for example, of real estate, I think you're raising an opportunistic fund. $10 billion? How's that going? Well, we're, we're raising money for a European fund. Actually, we're always raising money for a lot of funds, Francine. Uh, and, you know, we, we've gone through a big fundraising cycle. So we have over uh, $200 billion. It's one of the biggest pools of uninvested capital in the world. Uh, and that will be deployed uh, in due course. Interestingly, in real estate, which you just asked about, we're seeing a good deal of um, uh, volume of uh, buying things in Europe uh, because European real estate is, is under pressure uh, in large part because interest rates were so low here for so long. Sometimes in countries they were negative. So the borrowing costs to own real estate were next to nothing, and, and now it's closer to 6%. So if you have to carry a whole portfolio that used to cost you next to nothing at 6%, they need to sell things. You know, um, it, it, it's necessary to, to just hold their other properties. And so we're seeing some very, very good buys um, in that kind of environment because unlike most people, we, we have enormous capital and can buy the types of real estate that, that we like, whether they're uh, data centers, whether they're warehouses, whether they're student housing, where those sectors have done very well. Um, Steve, what can you tell us about rates? So have you seen any redemptions in, in that? How's that going? Rates? Rates. Rates. How do you say? B R E I T. You uh, say B-read. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, those, those redemptions have gone down. Uh, you know, they're, I think, 40 percent or something like that of what they were uh, a, a year ago. Uh, and, and so that, uh, that uh, pool of capital Stay is well. actually doing quite well uh, compared to almost all other real estate. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, we, we look forward to that sort of ultimately going back to a very normal uh, kind of world. It, overall, do, do, does UK politics seem benign compared to the US, but also what we saw in the Netherlands? Well, you know, commenting on politics, 
of other countries, let alone our own, which has a, a sense of drama uh, and, and you know, sort of incredulity, uh, is, is outside of my remit. Fair. Steve Schwartzman, thank you so much, as always. Uh, Steve also has to get to another a meeting right here because uh, people are coming and going in all the corridors, of course, of Hampton Court Palace, John. Francine, thank you. A wonderful destination location. Francine Lacroix alongside Blackstone's Steve Schwartzman there. Another fantastic conversation lined up for you a little bit later on this morning. Highlights of our exclusive conversation with the <coughs> British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. We'll catch up with Fran again a little bit later this morning. If you are just joining us, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. And welcome back, Steve. Side following a long weekend for many of you. I hope you enjoyed your time with your families. If not, well, welcome back big time. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative here by 0.1%. Let's just reset with some price action for you. Yields going absolutely nowhere, 446.26. We're picking up where we left off. It's the outlook for 2024. Another call in the mix, 5100. <coughs> Binky Charter, Deutsche Bank, 5100 on the S&P next year. So we're talking about 10% upside, Tom, and they're still calling well, for a recession, and they're calling for some pretty big rate cuts from this Federal Reserve as well I'm going into to next I'm year. I'm going to nominal GDP. Jim Bianco out with some smart math over the weekend uh, is, is well. And the basic line is, how, why do we have multiple 5,000 ideas? And the answer is we're overlaying this on top of four or, dare I say, 5% nominal GDP. There's a crew that goes against that. There's a crew that's looking for shockingly slow uh, growth. But how do you get to a 5,000 level? You get there by a lift in the American economy. I'm wondering what Stuart Kaiser City is thinking <clears throat> this morning. Exactly. I was reading his note About yesterday afternoon. Thing. His view, this rally is built on good data. When this data starts to turn, specifically, particularly in the labor market run. That's the view from Stuart Kaiser. So if you're over <clears> at Deutsche Bank and you're looking for, Lisa, 175 basis points of Fed cuts and just 0.6% GDP expected in 2024, what's taking stocks to 5,100? It's a great question. Is it enthusiasm, momentum? Is it the idea that we're going to have such a shallow uh, recession that it almost never happens? It's a good question, which is the reason why I think it's interesting. What's causing people to get to 5,000? It's that they look back and they said, what did they get wrong heading into 2023? Some of that. There's some they of that. weren't bullish enough. So let's be bullish yeah. for next year, because what's going to hurt? Yeah, Lori mentioned that. And, and it's a really important point that people feel behind, so they're going to lift up. But on a first order condition, I do think it's the wall of money that's out there. It's got to take part of that money. And you go in and I saw over the weekend a lot of, you know, I, I usually don't pay attention to like getting above or below the 200 day moving average stuff. But we're sort of at that cusp, John where, okay, is it a second leg of a bull market? A lot of people going, I don't know. But if you get the next lift up, wow, will things change. This Federal Reserve wants to be patient. <clears throat> and I think jobless claims last week, an endorsement of their stance currently. Absolutely. We're talking about a labor market no longer being a reason for being hawkish. We've been asking whether it's about to become a reason to be bearish. And then jobless claims drop to what is this? Just north of 200K. <coughs> 209. 209. 209. This is what the Fed's concerned about. They don't want to go too far at the same time. They want to make sure they've done enough to get inflation back down towards two. And Andrew Hollenhorst has been really clear about this of Citigroup, that there are reinflationary pressures that are going to come into play. No one's talking about that. That isn't necessarily going to be a risk case that people are looking at. So if that's the case, then they see, OK, you're just going to get a cooling <coughs> without a job uh, in jobless loss or jobs uh, being lost. And you're going to end up with the immaculate disinflation. We're way out, John, December 8th. Non-farm payrolls yep. from 150 actual past to a lift to 188,000 jobs formed. 188,000, as what Carl Weinberg said, that indicates a fully employed America. At this time of the year, I don't want to know when you think the Fed is going to cut rates. I want to know the conditions that will lead to the Fed cutting rates. Yes. The Federal Reserve, to some extent, can try and communicate that. I don't think they'll go to do that directly, given they don't want to entertain the idea cuts are coming anytime soon. But Stan Chart do it better. Eric Robertson just coming out and saying this, Bramo, their view, unemployment at 4.5 percent, core PC at 3 percent. He thinks that sets the stage, lays the groundwork, the foundations for Fed cuts in our future. Here's a key question to me, and a number of people have mentioned this, and I wonder what someone who's calling for 175 basis points of Fed rate cuts next year would say to this. Are they really going to cut rates before the presidential election? No, really. I mean, at a certain point, is this going to be a political concern, uh, especially given uh, that there has been 
accusation I, of political interference. You know, you know, I haven't even looked. I mean, this is echoes of my childhood is what I'm hearing here from Bramo. And, and my mother butchered the Brussels sprouts as bad as you did. Let me, let me be clear on that. But You're still scarred by this. Okay, I'm scarred. Well, November 7th. <laughs> I, I got a Fed meeting yeah. November 7th. <laughs> what day is the election? The 5th? I can't remember. Team coverage. I Same can't remember. Just November okay. 7. Looking forward to I, it. I would suggest, Lisa, maybe the November 7 meeting, they they're going to they're gonna adjust there. September 18th, they're still going to be unfed. They're not going to be birthday. political speak. Okay. We've got some housekeeping to do. <clears throat> Please. Let's start with the price action. Futures come in just a touch. We're down a tenth of 1% on the S&P. At least the yield's basically unchanged on a 10-year, 446.84. It's actually going to be a really interesting week. The economic data coming out, in addition to the Beige Book that comes out on Wednesday, is going to be really key. Maybe we'll focus more on inflation. I'm focused on core PCE deflator, the key indicator that the Fed looks at and how much it comes down. How much do you need to see it disinflate before people feel better about the prices that they're paying in the store? On Friday, we get ISM manufacturing as well. Treasury auctions. Today, we get $54 billion of two-year notes, $55 billion of five-year notes. I am watching these all very closely, particularly the five-year note uh, auction. Tuesday, $39 billion of seven-year notes. Those can be messy. Again, when do the auctions start to take center stage? I personally find this one of the most interesting aspects as people worry about the glut of issuance. And Fed speak, let's go through it. It's fun. Tuesday, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby warms up for his end-of-week performance. Fed Governor Chris Waller also on Tuesday. Wednesday, Cleveland Fed at Loretta Mester Friday. Fed Chair Jay Powell is giving a fireside chat. Fed Governor Lisa Cook and the Fed's Goolsby. Your again. excitement there was almost convincing. You know, actually, I am very curious to see how many ways you can say nothing. How many ways you could say basically, you know. <laughs> Five different ways based on that, apparently, <laughs> yeah, later this week. Ed Yardani joins us now, president of Yardani Research. Ed, good morning to you, buddy. You've been morning. constructive. You've been right to be constructive. Going into 2024, can you right. give us the reasons to maintain that stance? Well, I think the uh, the data of late has uh, confirmed uh, the scenario we've been uh, promoting, and that is uh, we can actually see inflation moderate without going into a recession. Uh, we think that a lot of the inflation we've had uh, is related to a, a rather important event that doesn't occur too often, and that's the pandemic. Uh, it uh, led to a huge surge in buying in, of, of goods, uh, and then uh, that stopped, and then a huge surge of buying of services, and I think that's starting to uh, slow down. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, the stock market has reason to be very, uh, very happy about that. One of the reasons, by the way, that we don't have to have a recession here to bring inflation down is because China is doing it for us. They're, they're, they're in a very precarious situation economically. Their prices are falling, and we import still a lot from China, and that's turning out to be what I call immaculate disinflation. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average, when you were Lou Rukeyser in 2000 on Wall Street Week, was 10,000. Your call now is for 41,700 on the Dow with your SPX 5400 uh, call. How do you not invest? I mean, if you've got a long-term move, mm -hmm. whatever inflation does, from right. 10,000 to 41,700, how do you handle the gloom so you can have the confidence to be in the market? Well, I think you've got to be uh, aware of the gloom uh, of what could go wrong. But uh, that uh, uh, side of the argument has been so overplayed uh, with no real balance in terms of what could go right. And so far, things are actually going right. Um, I, think, I think what the past couple of years have demonstrated is that uh, trading stocks is for, for, for traders. Uh, and you really have to invest in stocks. It's now, uh, Wall Street, uh, for some reason, uh, is encouraging people to trade. So uh, there was a lot of pessimism coming out of Wall Street um, last year, the idea being that uh, the market is in a bear market. And a lot of them got credit for calling the tops. They, they forgot to call the bottoms. And Ed, uh, I don't know that they've, they, they've, they've conceded yet. Ed, is there an analog here to 1977? Is this second leg of a bull market? Ralph Ancampora, Ed Yardeni, and other worthies in October, a long time ago, said this is the bottom. Okay, so now we've got a new leg. Do you identify here a second leg of a bull market? Well, I think we had a correction that started uh, July 31st and ended October 27th, and it was a classic correction of uh, roughly 10%. This whole year has been classic. It's the third term of a presidential cycle, which tends to be a very strong year. We had a 
very strong January barometer at the beginning of the year. People forget that the market was up 6% uh, just in January alone. So I don't know if it's a second leg. I think it's a continuation of the bull market that started uh, in October uh, of, of last year. And uh, that being the case, I think uh, we're at a very crucial point here uh, because if you uh, look at the uh, all-time high back in January of 2022 and connect uh, that point with the, the high we had on July 31st, we're right smack dab on that downtrend line. I think we're going to uh, break out above it. <clears throat> I think we'll be at new record highs for the S&P 500 early next year. Ed, what you said just there, this whole year is classic after starting with China right. and that China is doing the disinflation for us. How much is that really sort of the surprising fact underpinning this year, which is that essentially uh, the reshoring, nearshoring, nearshoring narrative is a fiction. And we still are very much in this global right. trade uh, world. And frankly, any slowdown in China is going to add to the disinflation that we're feeling right now, particularly mm -hmm. in goods. Well, I, this morning I sent out a note showing a very uh, simple chart that shows the year-over-year -year percent change in uh, U.S. import prices of goods from China. And uh, that's down 2%, uh, 2.5% uh, two on a year-over-year -year basis. It's very highly correlated, not surprisingly, particularly if uh, you, you, you recognize, as you just point out, that we still do a lot of business with China importing their goods. Uh, well, uh, it correlates very, very closely with goods inflation in the U.S., excluding uh, food and energy. We don't obviously import any of that from them. So China still matters a great deal uh, to us, to the global economy. They're exporting now a deflation, if you will. Uh, P their PPI is actually negative. And just on the labor market and inflation, is that no longer a reason to worry about price pressure, even with claims down towards 209K last yeah. week? Well, my mantra is growth is good, especially if it's based, not especially if it's based on productivity. And I'm a big believer that productivity is making a comeback. Uh, you asked me about uh, some analogies to the, the 70s. Uh, for a while there, uh, it was sort of uh, even Stephen between whether this was going to be the 1970s great inflation all over again with the twin peak uh, inflation outlook, or my scenario, which is the roaring 2020s scenario, where technology boosts productivity because we need to boost productivity because of labor shortages. And that's a whole different scenario than the 1970s. And put me in the roaring 2020s camp at this point. Still, Edgy Danny, thank you, sir. Edgy Danny sure. Research. Carl Weinberg of High Frequency Economics talking about the same thing at a previous hour. Look at equities this month. Take a pause. Jack Caffrey, JP Morgan, last week on this program good. said, what a year this month has been. Still a few days left. November, the Nasdaq 100 is up close to 11%. 10.91% higher on the Nasdaq 100 this month alone. What there's a move. A, there's an enthusiasm in those cautious, I think, of Doug Cass writing down in Florida. You know, Doug, is, Doug has been very cautious in the market. Dennis Gartman was brutal to himself saying, I got it wrong. But the answer is they're looking at the effervescence, the, what Schiller would call the exuberance, John. It's out there. I don't sense the exuberance. I'm not in an Uber where somebody's talking about that NVIDIA trade they made. I'm just not... I'm not getting the effervescence that is supposedly out there. I guess it's there, but I don't see Give it. Give it a few months. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. <laughs> maybe. No, no, I think maybe. that's it dead on. Best month on the NASDAQ 100 <clears throat> potentially since July 2022. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. The S&P this morning, negative by 0.1%. Yields going absolutely no way. Your 10 year, 446, 26. And Lisa, we like to tease you about auctions, but I'm with you. I think it is important. Oh, Maybe the last week, just showing signs of smaller moves, getting excited about a lack of volatility. Have we conquered it? We'll see. There'll be a test later this week. Well, the bid is coming in, and we saw that with the 20-year auction, right, last week. And this idea that people are suddenly liking the idea of longer-term bonds if they feel like there isn't necessarily going to be this tremendous uh, swinging yield going forward. So at a certain point, if we see successful auctions, <clears throat> can you signal that we haven't really, you know, that we've seen the end of the volatility? I mean, I don't, I don't want to say that, but there might be people whispering it. Partial score, folks. Auctions matters too. No <laughs> one cares. One. I, I just. You're not doing well, TK, no, on this story, I, are you? Last week, you know, Lisa nailed it a couple weeks ago with whatever the auction is. Other than that, you know, they get done. People show up. They buy American paper. At what price? I don't know. You know, I let leave that to Lisa. I'm lonely here. That's how I feel. Well, it's been a high rate. That's out. for sure. I feel, you know. Just, We're a family, Tom. It's okay. You know.
Don't, Tell don't me, get, don't come get on, you got a countdown clock at home. When do I go back to work? When do I go back to work? That's how we all feel over the weekend, <laughs> right? Sure, yeah. From New York City this morning, <laughs> beautiful New York City. Good morning. He is going to continue to focus on what is going to generate results. And as he said in the press conference quite clearly, and as you can see from the fact that for the last two days we've seen hostages released, the approach that he is taking, direct presidential diplomacy behind closed doors with the Israelis and with our Arab partners, that's what's generating the kinds of results that we're seeing right now. That was National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan speaking on NBC over the weekend discussing President Biden's impact on the pause <coughs> in the war between Israel and Hamas. The President of the United States, TK, seemingly putting more pressure on the Israeli Prime Minister to extend that truce. No question about it. I think the media over the weekend, it was without question the number one thing I saw across what well, let's call it transatlantic journalism newspapers, John, was this basic focus on the hostages and a focus less on then what, but on the immediate now in the story of the hostages. Is that a lack of will to support the Israeli Prime Minister to restart? Unsure. These and aggressive acts against Hamas in Gaza. I, I think the answer is clearly we're unsure on that. It's a movable target. Maybe that we'll get some knowledge on that today. But what I notice is the celebration of successful hostage negotiations to a then what? And no one knows what Biden taking is. it from all sides at the moment. Let's just sit on that oh, a yeah. bit longer. We mentioned this in a previous hour. Lisa, let's breathe some life into the conversation. How much daylight is there between what President Biden would like to see happen, what he's willing to support in the region, and what his own party, and maybe even his own State Department, is willing to support? Clearly, the daylight is pretty wide. Clearly, there has been a growing uh, dissonance between the views of some people inside his own party and inside his own cabinet, even, and where he's coming at this. The question is, how does that really evolve going forward? Today is the last day of this truce. Tomorrow, what happens? And I think that we really yeah. have to watch to understand what are some of the holdups that we hear as they try to negotiate okay. further. Who is exactly trying to influence who? Because you've got uh, President Biden, who is very much on the hot seat to try to push back any kind of resumption of, of, uh, of, the, of the conflict. But you also have Qatar doing the same thing well, over with Hamas. So, so the way you read this, Lisa, is today's debate. I mean, Monday evening, Monday afternoon into Tuesday morning in the eastern middle Mediterranean. Is the debate here to extend the truce? Is, is that the key point for the president this morning? It is to extend the truce under what conditions and for how long okay. and then what happens next. It's not necessarily people twiddling their thumbs. They're trying to gather intelligence, I'm sure, and trying to plan out some sort of strategy that there wasn't time to do before. We have seen far too much of him. He is an expert on turmoil, war, and terrorism. Aaron David Miller with a continued brief senior fellow Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Aaron, just let me just cut to the chase. If we get out to a point of negotiation, from where you sit, is there a Hamas to negotiate with now? Uh, there is, uh, and the Qataris and the Americans are validating uh, Hamas's effectiveness. The three of you are better analysts than I am because you, you've, I think, identified the core questions. Uh, there's growing daylight. The world is mad at Joe Biden, even though I think Frank, his own party's mad at him. There's a degree, 25 years at Department of State, I've never seen, never, the degree of dissension and vocal opposition to an administration's policy from inside uh, the foreign policy and national security space. Uh, one resignation, but an ex extraordinary amount of noise. I think the president, frankly, handled this pretty effectively. The Israeli-Lebanese border is relatively quiet. The fears of escalation into a regional war, which could produce plunging financial markets and rising oil prices, so far that's been avoided. And you're right to focus on hostages. But I think the deal is very clear. I'd be stunned, frankly, if this humanitarian pause collapsed. Hamas is trading hostages for time. They're hoping that the hostage families inside of Israel will continue to pressure the government uh, in order to redeem all of the hostages that have not been returned. Uh, the Arabs are angry, and the Israelis are going to face probably in the next week if the 10 hostages for a, a day of quiet, which is the offer on the table, if Hamas accepts that, doesn't add requests for more Palestinian prisoners, 
you could get another week out of this. But at some point, the Israelis are going to want to resume their ground campaign. And at that point, I think you're going to see growing awkwardness and uncomfortableness, maybe even tension in the U.S.-Israeli relationship. There's daylight between President Biden and some of his own uh, members within his party, within his uh, team that he has surrounding him. But he also reportedly has expressed concern about the collateral damage, about the civilians who have gotten killed, the incredible number, uh, more than people had originally expected. How much is that going to lead to pressure in a new way uh, that Benjamin Netanyahu, who is not exactly popular at home, will have to listen to? Uh, I think that's the core question. President uh, persona, alone among modern presidents, he he considers himself part of the Israeli story, uh, and is preternaturally his his emotional support for Israel literally is impressed on his on his DNA. The politics, as you point out, uh, he has to be concerned about rising the rising tide of opposition to the Democratic Party, but the Republicans who have emerged as a sort of Israel right or wrong party are also waiting for him uh, to pressure the Israelis so that they can pressure Joe Biden. And finally, there's, I think, the president's realization that he doesn't have many good answers to the two or three critical questions that the Israelis are, are, are facing with. How do you prosecute a war to eradicate Hamas without an exponential rise in Palestinian deaths. How do you surge humanitarian assistance into a war zone? And finally, what do you do about the proverbial day after? I suspect it's going to be weeks and months after. So I think part of the reason he's uh, reluctant to press the Israelis hard so far is because he doesn't have better answers for right. them on these core questions. Aaron David Miller, you're a student of this with your books back 30 years. Don't call it 30 years for, but I'm going to give you five years or 10 years forward. Is our relationship with Israel irrevocably changed? A fascinating question. The headline would suggest that generational changes in voter constituency, in Congress, uh, the growing uh, divergence between the United States uh, and the values proposition that Israel is a liberal democracy, more or less seeking the same things that we do, and growing policy differences suggest that, yeah, there is a lot of fraught tension in this relationship. Whether it's a headline or a trend line, that's the key issue. I suspect that the operating system that has kept the U.S. Israeli relationship pretty much uh, very close together is going to continue for quite some time. But again, we support Israel because it's an American interest to do so and because it reflects American values to do so. When those things change in the face of a right-wing Israeli government that's pursuing opposite policies, both at home and with respect to diplomacy on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, then I think the U.S.-Israeli relationship will begin to change. That tension is continuing to build. Aaron, thank you, sir. Fantastic to hear from you. Aaron David Miller there of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I want to turn to economics just for a moment. This from Cities, Andrew Hollenhorst, sitting the team just publishing moments ago. The run of Goldilocks data may continue this week, but upside inflation risk and downside activity risk mean the ultimate macroeconomic outcome <coughs> will not likely be risk positive. But perhaps that is somewhere out on the horizon in our future, just around the corner. Who knows? Here's the call for jobs next Friday, not this Friday. So payrolls Friday, two Fridays away, 200K plus new jobs, TK, for the month of November is the call from City just published. And 188 is a survey, and this is a fully employed America. I don't know where the number is now, John, but I'm going to suggest under 100,000, sort of the market goes, oh, things have changed. Maybe 125, oh, things have changed. Not 188, not 200. When you take it in isolation, it sounds <clears throat> like the number of jobs has come in. And yet when you take a look at jobless claims, people aren't filing for jobless benefits, and yet people are still getting hired. And I think that's what people are talking about with a fully employed America, speaking to this risk that Andrew Hollenhorst and the team are talking about, which is higher inflation, even with slowing growth. The jobs report a few Fridays away. The conversation coming up next with Sonia Martin of DZ Bank. That's just around the corner. Here's the state of play for you this morning. If you are just joining us, your equity <coughs> market's still negative by about 0.1% on the S&P 500. Coming into Monday, <coughs> decent couple of days of gains on the S&P 500. Two-day yeah. winning streak through Friday. 
four weeks, four consecutive weeks of gains, Tom, the longest weekly winning streak going back to June on the S&P. VIX under 13, 13.12. You know, you, you know, we only quote unemployment rates for football teams that win. University of Indiana, Bloomington, unemployment rate in Bloomington, Indiana, 3.1%. Don't tell me that's not fully employed. America, I did not check the unemployment rate in West Lafayette. They lost. Is that Purdue? That would be Purdue. Okay, boiler There's up. boiler down is the new phrase. Boiler down. Boiler down. <laughs> From New York City, good morning. Equity's a little softer on the S&P 500. Your scores look like this, pulling back by 0.1%, almost 02 lower on the S&P. We're down about 0.1 on the Nasdaq. The small caps, the Russell, down about a half of 1%. Switching things up to the bond market, we look like this on a two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Your 10-year yield unchanged, 446.84. The two-year still in and around 5%, 494.18. I think jobless claims a wake-up call for us all <coughs> last week. Let's see if that trend continues going into this week. And on to next week, looking ahead to pay Ross Friday Bramo City out of the gate looking for 200k plus next week and saying that the big risk for next year is a reinflation even with a slowdown in uh, activity in the United States this goes against what we've heard from a lot of people which is uh, yes you're gonna get a slowdown but the ongoing disinflation will create this nirvana for everything including equities and credit auctions Tom coming up five year notes thank you I've got the slate in front of me 55 billion dollars worth 39 billion of seven year notes coming up later this week. So I believe that's tomorrow, Tom. So we've got some big ones, five years, seven years, and tons of T-bills if you want one. I, am I wrong? Is a two-year like a big deal has come back near 5%? To me, it's like actual news. It speaks to the Federal Reserve and yeah. the amount they're going to be hanging in there, Tom, keeping rates yeah. where they are. You know, I look at that. The real yield here, I, do I have a quote yet? There it is, 2.21%. Sort of noodling, you know. Noodling. 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 Sort of churn. Like the euro. Let's We're sit on the euro here. just for a moment. The euro against the dollar. 109-ish, 109.50 through most of this morning. 109.50 right now, positive by 0.1%. Talk tons about Deutsche Bank's outlook <clears throat> for next year. Just for the ECB and the amount of rate cuts we're going to see. 100 basis points of cuts from June to year end in 2024. So looking at to next year, some of the ECB. Yes, yeah, Cerevel is fired up. There's a lot of people fired up about moves, but I don't see big figure moves. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's been snoozy. Yeah. Snoozy. Welcome snooze. I think snoozy. we all want that kind of snoozy kind of price action. I said the ECB we? was snoozy once. Lagarde, she I think we both a, did, and I think we both got in trouble a, for it. It wasn't a love that. note from that Christine particular. Lagarde. So you've mentioned snoozy every day. I remember. Yes. Sometimes they're snoozy, but I think sometimes that's the objective, no? I would agree. I yeah. think sometimes well, that's know, victory. They didn't think that that morning, okay? Under surveillance this morning, Israel under increasing pressure to extend a four-day pause in its war with Hamas. The current deal is set to expire early tomorrow unless an agreement is reached. So far, 58 hostages have been released by Hamas, with another 11 expected to be released later today. One of those released includes a four-year-old U.S. Israeli dual national whose parents were killed in the attacks on October 7th. Just reminding you of the tragedy that unfolded, Lisa, in early October. The fact that a number of these kids, quite a few of them, are going to be coming home without knowing that one or both of their parents have been killed, were killed on October 7th. The tragedy has been widespread. The key question is, have we reached the what's next point, given the fact that we have ended well, this four-day ceasefire and are starting you know, to either negotiate day by day or something else? Or something else. Do we have a war? Aaron David Miller just with us, uh, folks. This is 2008, a much too promised land America's elusive search for Arab-Israeli peace. It's still elusive, right? Nothing's changed, Lisa? I mean, right now we're trying to figure out what actually is going on behind the scenes. You can't. The conversations are widespread and they are going on actively. But it's clear that something has shifted. And it's sentiment, both for, with, for President Biden, but also it's sure. sentiment within Israel. That pressure's been building on the president for a while now. Your second story, deflationary pressures continuing in the world's second largest economy. The latest data out of China showing industrial profits slow to just under 3% year over year in October. Officials in China also mulling which developers will garner state support in the face of a $446 billion shortfall in the property market. That situation with the property market, Lisa, unfolding in the way that the China bears forecast years and years and years ago, barely gets a mention these days on Wall Street. Barely gets a mention. Part of it 
is because people say, well, the contagion is contained, <clears throat> right? It's not necessarily going to uh, percolate into other assets that people are invested in. There also is an expectation that the Chinese government is going to back the property market because there's no way they can allow the main investment for all of the rank and file in the country to just completely implode. And you're starting to see signs of that. And I think that that perhaps is what you're hearing in terms of bold calls. People <clears throat> are saying China's uninvestable. Well, if they start right. to invest a little bit more in themselves. I want to parse this, John, between what you just did there on property. Is that a motivational and on speech? Industry. What was that? Yeah, so it's very good. <laughs> Invest a little bit in yourself. <laughs> yeah, she, so she stole that. Thanksgiving day. I'd, I'd really she quite said like that. A mindful podcast. weekend. <laughs> Listening to motivation. She was you really want to hear? She, she really want to hear? She served the overcooked Brussels sprouts can, and it was I can choiceful. Hear it. It's brewing in Bramo's it's voice. Brewing, She's yeah. about to sort of, you know, unload. You know, unload lecture is the, the last week we're or not, so. We're not going to unload. I Go wondered on. earlier whether Tom had actually watched college football, but based on his summary of Purdue, it clear, clearly you haven't because they won. <laughs> Against Indiana. I did, but when I watched, yeah. they were losing. Big I actually got a, got a message from a Bloomberg subscriber. Oh, did you? Good morning. I think Purdue won. Just an F FYI. Thank okay. you, Jason. Thank you for writing again. <laughs> okay. On top of the no story. No more college football. Thanks for that, TK. <laughs> uh, let's get to this final story. President Biden skipping this year's UN Climate Summit, despite calling climate change the ultimate threat to humanity. The White House confirming the news to the New York Times late last night. Special envoy for climate change, John Kerry, expected to attend this year's COP28 in Dubai later this week. Vice President Kamala Harris not expected to attend either. Let's go back to late 2021, November, Glasgow, Lisa. Disaster. I think just an unmitigated disaster for this administration to go to Glasgow and say we need to end fossil fuel <coughs> use and then simultaneously at the same time be asking for the Middle East to pump more crude pump more crude. They were trying to make this a big, big priority of their agenda. And Tom, you use that phrase overtaken by events. Without a doubt, they have been yeah. overtaken by events. Totally, yeah. November 21, happy talk, move away from fossil fuels, whisper, please pump more, please pump more. They think you can maintain that, you can't maintain that. Here we are a couple of years later, got a war in Ukraine, got a war in Gaza between Israel and Hamas, and a president that is unable to make that a priority, Tom, at least in the and next it, week. To me, it's the domestic politics, and this goes back to what we were talking about before, the autocracy, uh, continental Europe, what we've seen in the Netherlands elections, much like what we've seen in Eastern Europe. And these are election winners who really care less about COP29, COP30, and beyond. These kinds of events, and right now, it seems like a no-win <coughs> situation for President Biden. And the fact that it's a no-win situation for him really is telling at a time where he is fighting with a real uh, breaking point at, of his party, given this was one of his main agenda points. That said, I don't really have a good sense of exactly why he's not going. Is it just because it's not going to be good optics? Is it because there's nothing that's going to come of it? Is it because he's tired and, confu and really consumed with everything with the Israel-Hamas war? Do you want to I, say I confused then? No, I, on I, the edge of I, saying kind of confused. No, there, there were like a lot of stories that gave lots of mixed things, and I don't really. Have I've been there. confused by the energy policy. I, I think it's almost hilarious to see crude production in America at 13.2 million barrels a day, and the administration just doesn't want to talk about it. Tom, it's kind of what they wanted, but at the same time, it's it's, changed. it's not what they want. It's yeah. not what they want, but it kind of is what they want. Yeah. We want to get inflation down, gasoline prices low for next year. We want crude production uh, up, but we don't I want know. to talk about it, just in case people look at the chart and say 13.2 million barrels a day. It, it's confusing, and it's completely overrun now by domestic politics. And that's yeah. true of every country, including Canada as well. Right now on foreign exchange and the lack of movement, Sonia Martin joins head of foreign exchange monetary policy at DZ Bankford in Frankfurt. Sonia, thank you so much for joining. Just simple as this. Is it so quiet out there that you can't foresee big figure foreign exchange moves into next uh, year? Is it just that simply flat out somnolent? Well, I mean, it has been fairly quiet on the FX front, but I think there are a lot of stories that are brewing and that have yet to show their full potential. When we look at your dollar, you saw that big move higher. It's stalling around 109.50. I think there, the timing isn't really right for the euro to make more of a latent dollar weakness. But that is going to change. I mean, you know, next year at the latest. But you know what? Actually, December tends to be a very good <coughs> month for the euro. Statistically speaking, it should be rising uh, until Christmas uh, and then fall right. again in January. So we'll see. John Farrell mentioned the international economics, the property economics investment in China, which is a sub 3% number. Our Deborah Aitken really talked in luxury about Chinese consumption could be a surprise here. Can there be a surprise in speculation on the Chinese yuan? 
Well, I think that the, as far as China is concerned, I mean, there are, at this point, I mean, things are looking pretty bleak, right? You just mentioned it in your report. I mean, the property market is still very much uh, in, under scrutiny. The, the PBOC announced this morning that it wants some support measures, but, you know, there's a limit to what they can do. And obviously, we know that the Chinese government is deeply indebted at this point. So, you know, the usual, you know, reaction of just printing more money here doesn't really work anyway. Um, I, I think, you know, China is not going to be any, any, you know, growth or positive story in any way next year. But the renminbi remains controlled. I mean, this is not a, exactly what you would call a completely freely floating currency. So I think the authorities are going to continue to keep a really close eye on this. And we've seen this happen, of course, over recent weeks and months. That's not going to change. Is the weakness that we're seeing in China good for the eurozone when it comes to disinflation? And I ask this because we were speaking with Eddie Ardeni earlier, and he was saying the U.S. is importing disinflation or deflation from China. Is it the same in Europe? To be honest, statistically, I do not know how big that impact is. Um, uh, you know, but there, uh, there has two sides, doesn't it? I mean, disinflation coming from soft demand is this, maybe it will translate some of that lesser inflation into Europe, but it will also mean less demand for our exports. So I'm not sure if that on the bottom line is a good thing for us. I think, in fact, when you look at, you know, European growth, it's really, really anemic. And, you know, we're in a recession in Germany. It's going to get better next year, but not very much. So what we really need is growth in China and not disinflation. What we've got here in America is tons of growth and elsewhere not much. Sonia, thank you. Sonia Martin there of DC Bank. Breaking news for you. <clears throat> Woke up this morning at about three something. OK, so this is like four hours into our day, correct? Apple battery, 50 percent. Over the last couple of weeks, just absolutely drained. Yeah, okay. Something this. something yeah. changed they wear on out. the phone. All of a sudden, bang, yeah. it's given up. So do so you suspect <clears throat> what happens now, Bramo? You have to buy a new one. Got to go and get a new one. It's a scam. What also, a scam. It's true. Seriously. All, you just wake up over the space of a couple of weeks, Tom. It wears all of a out. Sudden, 50%. It wears out. How, 50%. What, what, what's, what what do you have? iPhone you have? 3? Exactly. That's what I was going to ask. I don't have an iPhone 3. What are you talking about? Kylie iPhone, Minogue was number one. Pro. Kylie Minogue was number one when you bought that phone. A couple of years old. Yeah, it starts to, it starts to fade. They fade. <laughs> After two years. You yeah. know, our family has probably spent, I don't know, we were trying to like like calculate the thousands of dollars that we just, you know. But really, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I can't just keep talking. I try. You're speaking for yourself, uh, just for the record. Okay, Mrs. Keane wants to know. You're speaking for yourself? No, I'm not speaking okay. for myself. Just, all know. right, just, you know. You know we're just okay, all right, good. Working on there. Nice insight pace. on Apple I'll iPhones as well. I, you know, I've got to upgrade. Yeah, got to upgrade. Do you, but you resent it. With, I, absolutely. We're staying on. Skip DNA. So why don't you just get it's the battery? Why don't you just get no, it redone? Just, oh, just, uh, nah. Go into the store. Exactly. Deal with people. Deal with people. <laughs> talk to them. Get a new battery. Deal with crowds. Yeah, uh, deal with crowds. <laughs> We're looking at it. We're going through <laughs> Soho on <clears throat> Friday evening. Oh, my goodness. You couldn't walk, Bramma. I don't yeah, want to yeah. do that. No. Well, careful. No. I understand. No, no. It's just AT&T and t lock on and spit you out a new one. one. It yeah, turns yeah. up. It, you know. Don't have to deal with anyone. Let's keep it simple. If you're just joining us, <laughs> welcome. Your equity market, negative 0.1%. Year was unchanged on a 10 year, 446, 26. Auctions coming up a little bit later this week. Bramo locked in. I do think this is important Why? because it has jerked around equity valuations more than Fair. auctions ever before, number one. And number two, you say they get sold. OK, well, we get a sense of what they get sold at, who's buying them, whether people are pushing back at current levels. It gives you a sense of the buyer base just a little bit. And if not, what then does it, it gives say about the buyer the base? Are, are the Japanese it. and the Chinese still showing up to buy our paper? To some degree, uh, the Japanese have. But where they're buying is interesting, right? There actually has been more corporate buying again, from Japanese investors. They haven't shown up in as big of a numbers, but these are some of the mysteries people are trying to decode in all of these auctions. And then if it doesn't go well, everyone says, OK, the sky is falling and we're issuing too much debt and we're spending sure, too much yeah. money, and then the stocks sell off. I'll be front of the queue, front of the line talking about it. <laughs> That's essentially I think it what is, Look, I think it is a major theme, but I do wonder, Lisa, I'd love your opinion on this. Is there a tenor, a maturity <clears throat> that you think is more important to follow than another one. So this week is the belly, it's the five year and the seven year. Is it further out on the curve? Is it the 30 year? Where should I be focused? It's different for different reasons. The five year is interesting for rate cuts and expectations being baked into the market of just how much the Fed's going to rate, uh, cut rates and to what place. I think the longer end, it's really more a question of the debt issuance of the United States and some of the questions around credit rating agencies and things of that nature. That's the reason why I think that that's more 
compelling from that vantage point. I think I'm on the same page with you. I'm well, with good. you, by the way. I'm laughing okay. about it, but I'm totally on board. It's all right. I think this stuff is really, really important. Coming up in the next hour, Torsten Slock of Apollo Global Management mm -hmm. and a bit of announcement on a special show that we're doing with Apollo in the next week, Tom. We'll bring you some news on that in just a moment. From New York City, good morning. comfortable as, as you know possibly being prime minister of austerity no that's simply not the case actually government spending in the uk right now is at very high levels historically over this parliament it's grown at very high levels even in real terms after the impact of inflation so i think any uh, commentary or accusation that that's what's happening is just simply unfounded and we're at a point now given how people are feeling given the amount that's being spent where i think the priority has got to be lowering the tax burden that was UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak speaking with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix in an exclusive conversation addressing concerns of austerity in the UK. We'll touch base with Fran in about an hour from now. Mohamed Alerian touching base with us, writing in, here's the email, <laughs> Apple phone happened to me after I agreed to the iOS upgrade. TK, batteries getting drained worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. Battery gate. It's battery gate all over again. Yo, okay. Live in it. Living it. Yeah, Chris emails yeah. in from Poughkeepsie and, I think and, and, and evidence you know, is the Verge, Apple's Put iPhone battery page. gate settlement. John, this settlement payment should be going out soon. I'm going to check. You'll get a payout I'll from Apple check. on I'll your Put that towards battery. my new iPhone. For your next iPhone. <laughs> Precisely. That's how it works. Equities on the S&P <clears throat> look a little something like this. We're pulling back just a touch. No drama here. We're down by 0.2% on the S&P 500. A TK in the FX market. G10 is a bit of a snooze. 109.52 yeah. EM getting a whole lot more interesting. Javier Mille over in Argentina, touching down here, by the yeah. way, in America. It's going to be interesting to see, to say the least. Right now, we're going to get a, a briefing here from Damien Sassar, Chief Emerging Markets Credit Strategist for Bloomberg. And, of course, also Bloomberg Business of Sports really paying attention to college football. Massive surveillance correction. I watched a game. Indiana was killing Purdue. And, I, boy, did I get this wrong. Boiler up, I guess, is, is Boiler what up. happened. Can you make money in sports on college football? Only if you're funded in peso. No, I'm kidding. I, I think really at the end of the day, college football is a crapshoot like most things in this world. But um, yeah. but the Iron Bowl, I mean, Michigan OSU, I watched that game with you know parties from both sides and it was such an awesome game. I mean, it was it was just back and forth. And look, I mean, right. OSU won the battle on offense, but they lost the turnover battle and they lost the game. The strategy on this has got to be clearer than the strategy on Argentina. How do you play? How do you bet? on Argentina. Well, I guess you don't bet against batteries, Jonathan, because there's plenty of lithium in Argentina. No, I mean, really, Javier Malay is obviously a bit of a, a firebrand in terms of what he stands for. He stands for dollarization. He wants to burn down the BCRA, the Banco Central de la República Argentina, Ooh, their central impressive. bank. Wasn't that nice? nice? It rolled up nice. the tongue. Does he still smooth. want to do that? He certainly does, but not at the pace I think that, you know, we would have other. I mean, you have to understand the central bank is funding the entire public sector in Argentina through LELICs, which are the short term interest rate, you know, peso dominated interest uh, kind of structures, instruments. Sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. And um, you just can't take one trillion peso denominated debt and just wipe it away and hope that everything's going to go away. You're not going to be able to pay employees. You're not going to be able to feed your economy. And so, you know, dollarization is probably a, a little bit longer down the road, but Look, this is an economy that's running 143% year-over-year CPI. GDP is going to be down 25 to 3% this year. The central bank is targeting a fiscal deficit of 1.92% in order to make the IMF happy relative to GDP. It's going to be 5% this year, Lisa. So they've got their own problems, and it makes all the sense in the world, not just for Malay to be here in the U.S. today, but to have stopped in, uh, in Brazil on the way up and to have visited Lula. Yeah. Before we get to the international politics, just focus domestically just for a moment. Do we know who's going to run the central bank? And ultimately, Luis Caputo, yeah. So does it matter? It does, because we're harking back to those days under Macri when they issued that century bond that we, you and I have talked about repeatedly. Federico Sturzen uh, Egger, who was the central banker, the head of the BCRA, who really blew up and started the bank run in Argentina back in 2018. Uh, Caputo succeeded him, so he's been around the block, he's dealt with the IMF, he's dealt with uh, Cristina Giorgieva, um, they've already spoken. He's a good choice, but you know, there aren't many good choices in Argentina given their recent history. The IMF loves the establishment. This guy is the anti-establishment candidate. Yeah. But he is going to do effectively some of the stuff they'd like him to do, right, which is deep cuts to 
government spending. There's a lot of things he does stand for, which I don't think we're talking or covering enough. I mean, his view on uh, feminist rights, on abortion, on China, on the Pope. I mean, not the greatest views if you believe everything he said. But then again, he's backtracking on a lot of the things he said. So it's getting to a point where I don't really know what to believe. Who is the man? I mean, the markets just want to believe so much that Argentina is on the way back. But um, investors like myself have gotten burned before. So you had the phones tapped and you were listening to his conversation with Kyrgyzva. And I'm curious, what do you think the tenor of those conversations in all seriousness really are between the IMF and the leadership in Argentina currently? All right, so where are we? They made a $2.6 billion payment on their $43 billion in debt to the IMF back in October. That's a very good sign that they want to continue doing business with the IMF. They don't want to be blocked out of U.S. capital markets or global capital markets. Um, but, you know, what they need to do, and in order to get the ship righted, it, it, it's just going to be a lot. The seventh uh, review of their extended fund facility the agreement with the IMF was set for the end of this month. They're not supposed to be talking about any of this in Washington or New York this week, by the way. But I'm sure that will come up. And, you know, what structural and economic reforms does the IMF need to see in order to permit the flow of capital, permit the flow of dollars into their economy, even if they want them? I mean, that, that's, that's another question right now. So. Well, Argentina is a specific story. They've defaulted, what, five times over the past hundred years, something those of that keeping nature. Count? Yeah, sure. uh, there has been a lot of concerns about inflation for a long period of time, but there's something that they have in common with a lot of developed market nations as well, which is that a lot of people have gotten used to debt have gotten used to spending more than you can pay for and are going to have a very hard time weaning themselves of this. How much is this going to be an issue across a much broader swath of the developing world in particular, not to mention the developed world, in a way that really isn't being priced in? Well, we can kick the can down the road as long as we want to, so long as the markets will allow us to do that, Lisa. And in the case of Argentina, you know, if you want to take the bull, you know, case, Vaca Muerta, lithium deposits we just talked about, soy and agricultural exports, opening up the economy. EPF is up. EPF has an ADR in the U.S. It's up 65 percent <laughs> since November 16th. One of the largest, you know, it's the national oil producer out of Argentina. Grupo Galicia, their big finance conglomerate, mm -hmm. is up. You know, 30% since this election. So, you know, investors are taking this business-friendly environment seriously. And they do have potential right. sources of future revenue to help offset that debt load. What is the most efficacious way to play China? Hmm. If somebody has a belief, it's, John was mentioned, in sub-3% growth, or you're more optimistic than that, what's the the way that Damien Sassauer speculates on a China recovery. I, I think, you know, the thing that people aren't talking about about China is what is the one item between the U.S. and China that both the Republican and Democratic, Democratic Party agree on going into an election year? Tariffs and the fact that they should go up. And what does that mean for dollar yuan? It's probably not a good thing. But, you know, again, really, I think China's going to follow the broader EM currency base, and that's going to be largely a, mm -hmm. a function of do you believe in a soft landing? Or do you believe in a recession in 2024? And there are good trades on either side. I mean, the, generally speaking, if you believe in a soft landing, you want to be long EMG 10 X dollar versus dollar, and vice versa. If you believe in a recession, you're long dollar versus G10 uh, FX and EM along with it. So that's kind of the way you have to balance yourself. Uh, Damien, this was great. Thank you, sir. It's good to see Thanks. you. Damien Sasa, we're getting so much stick about your coverage of Purdue. How did you get it so wrong? You said you watched the game. I watched the game and then I turned uh, it off the game like did you 10 watch? minutes ago. They scored 17 <laughs> points in the back half. I mean, I may lose my job over this. You missed the, the back half. I missed and the back half. just come out on, air on X Monday number and minutes they lost. And they weren't even like in the game. They were comatose. Okay. And then boom, what a comeback. That's how much college sports you watched. You guys nailed over it. The you asked me about, right. you know. You know, Leclerc did great in the Formula One he too. He did, did great. <laughs> Ferrari not so much. Just Max Verstappen absolutely dominating. The only, it was a lot of the fun. only race that Red Bull this year didn't win, I think, was Singapore with Carlos Sainz. They won every okay. other race. In world sports, I can't think of many <clears throat> dominant seasons in any sport like the one Agreed. we've just seen in Formula One this year. But was the race boring? I mean, with the way it was spread out the last 10 laps of the race, is that the way you run a world-class sports organization? They were just going through the motions. It is the difficulty of Formula One, Tom. How we've had these change? long periods of dominance. They've tried to change it a million times. Okay. I don't, I don't we've know. We've seen that. it with Red Bull, right. before that Mercedes, before that Red Bull. You saw it with Ferrari in the late 90s and early 2000s. And it's the difficulty, I think. Part of the difficulty conquering 
this sports market in this country. Netflix has gone only so far, but ultimately, when you know the outcome of the game before well, you start, it's not exciting, is it, Damien? No, it really no, isn't. No, it's not. I mean, we were just talking about the EPL, too. I mean, like, the fact that, you know, you have a salary cap in the NFL is what makes it so interesting. It keeps it so parity-driven. The Broncos, the Titans, the Giants, the Packers, they all won this week. I mean, people had written them off. The and Jets now they're win? actually in the playoffs. I was at the Jet game, by the way. We're not going to talk about that. We're, at? we're not going to talk it about that. It was that bad? I left at the half. Ooh. It was unwatchable. Oh, Mohammed left at the first unwatchable. quarter. Unwatchable. <laughs> unwatchable. My son and I, my son's in from college and we Is left Rod at the Is Rod just coming back? There's talk that he, I hope not at this point. I, I don't know. I hope so. I don't you know. I don't know what I hope rest, for anymore. Sit the rest of the season out. And... I got to talk to Mohammed. I mean, I'm sweating thinking about it right now. Did you have Mohammed's tickets? 50 yard line? Six rows up? I saw him up there. You know, yeah. we were, you know he wouldn't turn around. He's and aged. Look at me. <laughs> He's aged. You know, that's all there is to it. You know the secret about Mohammed? He won't mind me sharing this. He sits in the nosebleeds. Seriously, yeah. kind of guy that would fly coach domestically, which I always, always moan at him about. But yeah, you'd probably find him in He's the nosebleeds. He's up in the nosebleeds. Loves the nosebleeds. I was there in tennis. Mets and when Jets. Was playing. Just sort I mean, of torturing I'm, I'm himself like waving every at year. Going. It's, the, it's the sports. spirit. <laughs> it's the spirit that you get there. The spirit of losing. Re really? Is that right? No. Is that right? From no, New it's York. The spirit. This is Bloomberg. Joy. Until you see you know, some slowing in inflation, rates will, will stay high. Inflation is moderating. I think the biggest risk is a stagflation scenario. And there's also a chance that inflation, you know, doesn't fall back to one and a half, that it gets stuck at two and a half or three. The highest conviction is that there's no eases until at least Q4. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television with oil. Under $75 a barrel, one indication of how you get to SPX 5,000. That's the feeling this morning, Jim. Well, maybe 5,100. Tis the season. Yeah. It's when your economics department come out and say, OK, recession next year. 175 basis points of cuts just around the corner. That's the call from Deutsche Bank. And then you're the equity strategist that's like, ah, well, I've got 5,100 on the S&P, so let's try and make that work. How do you make that work? 5,100 on the S&P. You make it work. The same year we got recession and 175 basis points of cuts. Disinflation in, John, I got 74.99 on West Texas Intermediate. Boy, does that help the optimist. That's the secret sauce. Yeah. You get the disinflation, Lisa, without the economic pain. And so far <clears> this year, so good. And that's the reason why people are willing to believe it, because it's the one thing they actually got wrong was being too pessimistic. And so that's why perhaps there is a bias to be optimistic, if at all possible, and even... But how much of this is the bias? Some people are looking single-digit lifts. I believe David Costin's there looking for a really fractional, you know, germane up market, but there... And then you got others like Ed Yardini with a real jump condition optimism, and that's the parsing of these bullish calls. You know, it's also which, are, which stocks are we talking about? There aren't that many agree, people who are saying, I'm all agree. in on Russell 2000. They're not <clears throat> saying that. There, maybe later next year we can get there. But I in didn't the hear meantime, Lori Calvacina say that. But in the meantime, rate cuts are going to be good for big tech. Sure. That's going to keep driving everything. It can keep being lopsided. And then all of a sudden it, you start to get participation around the, uh, the edges. Let's get that board up again and take a quick snapshot of what people are looking for next year. And there's two names I want to talk about. One is Goldman Sachs. The other is Deutsche Bank. So Goldman and Jan Hatzius, right, next year. They think the tailwinds for growth continues, that the Fed can hold through most of the year because growth is going to be pretty good. And their equity strategist is saying 4,700 on the S&P 500. Deutsche Bank, the economics team, is saying recession and 175 basis points of cuts. And their equity strategist is the most bullish currently on the street for next year. It makes sense of that for me. You can make the economic call and apparently radically different equity market calls. Yeah, no thanks. I'm not going to try to make right? sense. Right, I mean, Tom, Tom, this is what <laughs> just, we're looking at here. No. Just, just leave that up and go through the numbers. What we're hearing from Wall Street again, and you'll love this, is that bad news is good oh, news. Kill me. And what you're hearing from Goldman is you're going to get more good news, but it's priced. The starting point is we're too elevated. Tom, that's the view currently, and all of this can change, obviously. We'll get a range of views going into year-end. I'm end, with but the fair rule, March 31. Deutsche Bank and Goldman. Yeah, you're going to see things change, Tom. <clears throat> I, You'll I, see I... things change. Last week alone, you start to build this trend in jobless claims. They're starting to climb higher. Then all of a sudden, 209. Blow it up again. Well, that's, you know, that data dependency. Well, that's data dependency to, to December 8th. But 
The bottom line is a huge misguess on the American consumer. It's 70 percent of GDP. And the arch call this year has been an underestimation of consumer power. I would suggest that still is there. Deborah Aitken of Bloomberg Intelligence was brilliant on Wednesday or Tuesday last week about the oomph of the American consumer. And we did see that in terms of Black Friday numbers. We were talking about the Adobe figures, particularly online, coming at 7.5% more than the year before. And yet, we did hear all these warnings from the likes of the CEO, Doug McMillan, of, uh, of Walmart, talking about a real deceleration in spending. So, I don't know. It's Walmart's really confusing. talking deflation. Best Buy saying we might have trouble going into year end. And then you look at online sales. Through the roof. Boom. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't, not having a lot of trouble making sense of this because there are these different economies and different products that people are buying at disproportionate paces. It's a motley picture. You get the averages. <clears> it doesn't really portray. A real clear picture. It's a motley crew. Is that what we are? Well, yeah, motley, I think motley some, crew talking about some a motley could, yes. picture. And Equities. Motley. Your picture right now. Russell Equity Spratt. futures on the S and P coming in just uh -huh. a touch. More than resilient this month. We're down a tenth of one percent this morning. This month, TK double digit gains. <laughs> double digit gains on the Nasdaq 100. Well, we had to guess to Caffrey. Jack Caffrey's got a little bit of experience saying we did a year in one month. Yes. You know, I think that what a year November's been. I, I'm interested in what, what the, how the hedge fund losses are going to be. Some of the losses to be discussed here in the first quarter of next year, who, who get it wrong. Let's do this. Let's dive here after a brilliant data check here again. Oil 74.92 to Peter Cheer. He's head of macro strategy at Academy Securities. I want to play off Torsten Slock of Apollo, who's going to join us here in 30 minutes. And the basic idea, Torsten was just fabulous on this. He went back to Nifty 50, 1972. Polaroid's beginning a lawsuit with the Eastman Kodak company. Edwin Land and all the magic camera stuff is on top. And the PE multiple off of a Polaroid with a 95 uh, multiple was just was absolutely um, stunning. And they said, you know, we're buying these seven companies now and this is the way it is. Why does this end? I think it's already starting to end even. If you look since the middle of November, you've actually seen an outperformance by the Russell 2000. You've seen both the equal weighted NASDAQ and the equal weighted S&P outperform. So I think you're starting to see a shift of that. If you look what happened last week, I think it was really encouraging. Nvidia had earnings. They seemed okay. The stock drifted a little bit, but the markets did well, especially the Russell and the equal weighted. So I think we're going to see a little bit of a transition in leadership coming into year end. Without a recession, you get that transition in leadership. I think you do in the near term. And again, this is, I think, very tricky. I think we this are headed towards recession, but because, as you mentioned earlier, it's been so resilient, the first few readings are going to indicate soft landing. People are going to be excited. So that's where we get this one last gasp. I was thinking 4,600 on S&P 500. Maybe it's 4,650, 4,700. So it expands a little <laughs> bit. And then people will start realizing, ooh, we're going to have recession and we're going to stay with somewhat high inflation because of all the rebuilding that we're doing. Crystal ball, what is that ooh moment? Claims? Non-farm you know, payrolls, what is it? I think it's probably going to be a combination of non-farm payrolls, a little bit on sales. I think we we're going to find, yes, Black Friday sales were great, but everything was discounted. People took advantage of all these sales, and then we're going to see it drop off a cliff coming into December. So I think it's by the end of December, first weeks in January, that's when we get that uh-oh moment and that we went too far. We priced in this whole, you know, bad news is good. That's going to last for a little bit, but I'm thinking late December, early January, you want to reverse this and you want to get long treasuries and short equities rather than long both. Well, if you get long both, the theory is that the Fed's going to cut rates pretty aggressively, and that's going to give a boost to the valuations of companies that already have gotten a boost to some of their valuations just simply because of their profits, namely uh, the Magnificent Seven. How do you push back against that if you're not calling for people to massively lose their jobs and if you see that really is there still is a lot of strength and momentum? Because one, while I think the Fed is done hiking, I think they're going to be fairly slow to cut. And again, we're going to have stimulus, right? We are going to try and build out our energy infrastructure. We're trying to do this reshoring. So I think inflation's not going to allow the Fed to cut very much. And that's a big part of it. So, and on top of that, just like I've been saying, since the last week or so, you've seen that leadership lose, right? So I think that story is already overplayed. People are like, OK, we've run these up as high as we can. Everyone who wants to be in those AI companies or the Magnificent Seven is already in them. They're weakening. Everything else is doing better. And to some degree, at some point, we're going to need to see AI translate to better profits for companies that are actually using the AI, who can justify the cost benefit and say, hey, somewhere in our numbers, this is actually working. And it's got to accrue to that. You should see higher multiples across the board and some give up from the producers.
What is the problematic figure for inflation, the inflation rate that we're tracking right now, where it becomes sticky and something closer to a stagflation and less this immaculate disinflation? So I think we get a bit more disinflation in the numbers. It's going to be goods related. But then we're going to keep cropping up into that two and a half to four and a half percent range. And I think two and a half to three and a half, the Fed's going to ignore it because they realize there's these structural things going on in the economy and how we're reshoring, how we're separating from China. Above that, then they have to get hockeys. That's why I don't think we're going to see that number of cuts next year. <laughs> I look at the great missed call this year and its sales growth. It was featured over the long weekend. Goldman Sachs looked at 11%, magnificent seven growth forward versus 3%. I go back to DLJ years ago and Tom Gelvin, who said, look, just look at the top line as well. Do you see an erosion of the top line of say 30% of Standard & Poor's 500 that gets it right? I don't think so, but I, I think even as you mentioned what Torsten was saying about the Nifty 50 going back to the 70s, I attended a great presentation. It was in 2000. Michael Milken, we were at the Bankers Trust at the time, High Yield Conference. Michael Milken said, there was a person, Merrill Lynch, I think it was in the 70s, said, buy tech. And everyone think, how do you think you did? This is 2000. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, they must have had everything right. They got it completely wrong. At the time, the leaders in tech were DAC, uh, digital equipment, all these things, wang, that actually turned out not to keep pace with technology. So do you think there's an equivalent now? I think we've got to be careful, and that's why you want to start looking at what's very highly valued, what's trading at super high multiples, this what's great. going what to have banner. to grow into something, whereas who's going to step in? Who's going to pick up the so slack? Shear says Google is like Wang. Does that work? I am not going that okay. crazy. It's well, like, I think, I think these are great companies. We need to dig into it. Do you think this AI moment is similar to what we saw in the late 90s, early 2000s? Again, for me, AI right now, all the benefits are accruing to the AI producers, right? The web service companies, all those yet nothing really is accruing to the average company. And if AI really works, so if you can really get a cost benefit from using AI, we should be able to place higher multiples on all companies because they should start seeing earning trajectory. So I think in the next three to six months, we're going to see are companies able to justify the spend on AI or not? Where does the comparison leave off? Are we going to see a plunge in valuations, in your view, under this prescription, akin to what we saw in the 2000s? Or is this going to just be a stagnation of valuation for a prolonged period while everyone else plays catch-up? I think this would be much more a leveling off and everyone else plays catch-up. So I really like the compression trade. So that's why I think you know, S&P goes to 4,650, maybe 4,700. But under that performance, I would see the Russell 2000 maybe doubling that total return in that period. So while we go from 4550 to 4650, 4700, the Russell can do much better, and I think the equal weighted will do better. As people start looking, what, what have we missed in this whole chase for the Magnificent Seven? And as people get stopped out, and remember, I think this has been a very large hedge fund trade, long the Magnificent Seven, short everything else. So as that compression starts, you get this unwind into a fairly thin market, and that's why I think all it's going to take is a little bit of positive news on China, where the administration gives something to China, that spurs that last bit of this rally, and it'll be less dependent on the rate move, and more dependent on that. You tell brilliant stories. Can you tell me more about that chapter where China starts to get nice things from the U.S. administration? You know, I think as we head into election year, everyone's very concerned about where we stand. I think, look even at chips, right? It's a crucial that we do not let China take technology that's going to be very competitive on AI, on the military front. But there's some level of chips that I think our companies need to be able to sell into China to maintain the profit, to build out the foundries. So I think there's going to be balancing acts there. I think on some of the tariffs, well, the previous guest said both sides kind of like tariffs, which if you go back, remember the Democrats hated tariffs when Trump put them in, and everyone seems to have been comfortable They're with that. They're still there. So I would not be surprised to see some sort of path to reducing the tariffs. Hey, China, you do this, we do that. I think everyone just wants to see a bit of encouraging news on that front. We just had these four-hour meetings, blah, blah, blah. Something comes out of that is the way politics seems to go. Okay. Pete, good to see you. Good to see Always you too. Always is. Peter Chair of Academy Securities. Thank you, sir. If you aren't just joining us, welcome. Your equity market set up as follows on the S&P 500. We are negative by 0.1%. Yields are a little bit lower by a couple of basis points. 444.89. Torsten Slock of Apollo joining us in about 15 minutes' time. Next week... <coughs> Live at the Apollo, going to Apollo hey. HQ. It's actually the tagline of Apollo for the special show we're doing with them next week. Tom, Jim Zelta, Mark Rowan, Torsten Slock, fantastic lineup. Huge coming up next timely. week. Going to be mean, very cool. Beyond timely, one of the great, great mysteries here is the state of private investment in America. Beyond, it's even more timely than our killer conversation in London.
you know, a couple months ago. Yeah, so we'll be doing yeah. that next week. More details on that still to come <coughs> later this week. Coming up on this programme, Dana Towsey of Towsey Advisory Group on the holiday shopping season. Black Friday numbers look fantastic. We'll see if those numbers can continue going into year end and right the way through the holiday season. Uh, TK, I'm going to run off and charge my phone. So coming up in the next hour, Colin Martin of Schwab, Samir Samana, Wells Huge Fargo. It's going to be very, very cool. Just restart it. Katarina Simonetti of Morgan Stanley. On their call for 4,500, which is basically where we are. That's their call for next year, <coughs> year end on the S&P. Yeah, that's a courageous call. The marketing guys want you to go up, up, up. I mean, that's the bottom line of Wall Street. I think the marketing guys at Apple would like me to shut up, shut up. Yeah, but, um, you know. The conversation's ongoing, Bramo. You're going to fight the... Battery gate <laughs> from New York City. Good morning. We now have been able to get new categories in as a result of Marketplace, which is now online at both Bloomingdale's and in Macy's. So I, I bet on department stores, and obviously I've made my career doing this. And it is a, you know, it's still very, very relevant. We're going to be ready for where the customer is evolving. And we've got very strong assets to be able to do that, both on mall and obviously online. Mr. Jeanette, after the parade, I watched the parade. Did you watch the parade? No, I did not. I watched some of the parade. It's like pretty, you know, it's like the, the balloons now, there was wind here yesterday. The balloons were so low to the ground. It's like you could almost, I liked them, you know, years ago when they were, you know, higher. You liked it better then. There was but then there was tension. an accident. There was more tension. There was a because, terrible yes, accident. So after that, accident. they brought it down. I mean, it may be more yeah. tension. Yeah. It was you know, potentially flawed. I watched. It was on like six networks, which shows you how big the Macy's parade is. That's Mr. Jeanette of Macy's selling forward in the season, obviously, with good chat. We're going to keep this quick because our guest is so uh, important. Market's resilient here. Negative five down, negative 52. VIX says it all, 13.09. Oil under 75 on American oil, two-year yield 4.93%. Uh, Let's talk you and me a little bit of retail. I was thunderstruck by one headline I saw in the zeitgeist this weekend. Oops, we got it wrong. Retail looks good. I did not expect that. Which retail? And this is what I really want yeah. to focus on. Is it just the <clears throat> online uh, stores, the idea that you can shop whenever? We were talking right. before with some people who were saying that the stores weren't even open on the day after Thanksgiving that early. They opened up late. Uh, you know, <clears throat> again, how much does this create some tension right. between who's winning really here versus how much the consumer is just spending everywhere? And of course, an increase of 7.5% versus last year uh, killed everyone. There's no one better to speak to on this is if you stand at the four corners of 57th Street and Fifth Avenue. The Dana Telsey is a child gazing upon Bergdorf Goodman and across the street to Tiffany's and where Louis Vuitton is now and there's some other unpronounceable I can't afford store on the other corner. Telsey joins us now, CEO, Chief Research Officer of her Telsey Advisory Group. You got this right. A lot of people got this wrong. How did you expect this optimism that we come out of the season? Well, thank you very much for having me and hope you guys had a great holiday. That's okay. I think overall, <clears throat> keep in mind, we did have a barrage of earnings reports all talking about the cautious consumer. Inventory levels are lean. Promotions were in place, 30 to 40 percent. That isn't outstanding. That isn't going off the rails in terms of level of promotions. They were definitely clean. What you saw in terms of traffic, look at the Lululemons, the Bath and Body Works. Macy's was, had more traffic than what you had at Nordstrom. And off-pricers like TJX had a ton of traffic. And the teen retailers picked up. The reason why? Value and innovation. If you had value and you had innovation, the consumer was coming. So look at Uggs and Hoka where there was innovation. You look at the value on the pricing, it meant something. But we have a long season coming up now. Christmas is on a Monday. Watch that weekend before Christmas because procrastinators, it's their choice of when they want to spend. Just let's build on that, this idea of watch what happens later in the season. Are you saying that you suspect people brought forward their shopping much more than they had in the past because they are being cautious? So the numbers are inflated to represent that more than just excessive spending altogether. Yes, I think you look at the savings rate, which has come down, you take a look at delinquencies, which have gone up, and you look at what's happened with the pattern of promotions. It began in October. So with Amazon Prime Day in October, their second Prime Day, you had a pull forward of what the promos were, and of course online is gonna be strong. Stores are no longer open on Thanksgiving Day. So what did people do? They shop with their phone, mobile mattered. Well, this really raises this question. Is it the modality of shopping that matters right now, or is it the type of product mix 
that matters right now. And I'm curious, can you parse that up? Is it just online shopping or is it the products that people are getting online? It's the products that people are getting. And don't throw out the stores. The stores matter. The engagement that people have, the social interaction. So many companies in 2023 came out with new store formats. You look at on mall and off mall, they both won. And even outlets are strong in that measure for value. Where's the best total return of 12 months? You and Joe Feldman are not on speaking terms on this, but the basic idea of which kind of retail and which individual stock is the best possibility? Off price, I think, is going to win over the next 12 months. TJ Maxx would do So that's Hermes, store. Louis Vuitton, you know, off LVMH, price. off price. Not luxury. Okay, so <laughs> continue. Different world. It's off price. It's the TJ Maxx's of the world, the Burlington's and the Ross stores. Why? They're getting the benefit of a trade down. Look at what you just saw in their results last week yeah. when they each delivered same store sales of at least 5%. When you, typically, <clears throat> these are 3% same store sales increases. They're getting the benefit of the trade down. There's been a heritage of TJ Maxx executing. What's the secret sauce that makes them do that? The experience of their buyers. They know how to buy. They have the relationships with brands. Brands like being in their stores and they sell through. And don't forget their locations. The, the description that you're painting of the American consumer is not that positive. It's one that is trading down, as you said. It's one that has caution, that might not show up uh, in force before that Monday Christmas. So where are we in this cycle, right? I mean, is this a matter of people running out of money or is it just them saying, well, we've been spending a lot recently. We probably should uh, be a little more prudent. They had more money two years ago with the stimulus package during the pandemic. <clears throat> the low to middle income consumer is battered right now by higher interest rates. Even though inflation's moderating, it's still a higher price than it was in the past. And even you take a look at the luxury consumer, you need the feel good factor. With the geopolitical issues going on, the macro headwinds out there, and the volatility of the stock market, it makes it more challenging. So that's why experience, look at the Taylor Swift concerts over the summer, what people are willing to spend on. Give them something innovative, they'll be there. So what does this say about the trajectory of the consumer and how people are going to be spending? Is this the beginning of more pain or is this basically the bulk of it? <clears throat> I think this is in the middle of the pain that we're seeing. I think the focus on essentials is right there. I think you need newness in order to drive demand. And even though the labor market continues to remain very good, the watchwords are out there and saying, yeah. what's it going to look like? And inventory is cleaner. So you don't need to promote as deeply as you had in the past. Look at what's happening with the department stores. They're ordering more cautiously. And why are they ordering cautiously? If they don't feel the demand is going to be, be there, they'd rather sell at full price than markdowns. And your right. most profitable markdown is your lowest markdown, not your greatest markdown. Toughest job in retail this year is a guy named Sabata DeSarno at Gucci. Absolute toughest, toughest job. Dana Telsey on what Gucci's going to do right off that corner of Fifth Avenue and 57th. I think they're going more basic than they've ever been before. Absolutely. I'm they're going seeing... away from what the yeah. idiocy was for three years. Yeah. The mismatching of the three years is all about matching now. And it's about safe. They're going back to their archives and seeing what can they reinvent and update is for today. Is there proof of that we want that? Is there proof that will sell to the Chinese? I think there's some proof it will sell to the Chinese, but we're not seeing the Chinese travel yet. We need them traveling to really drive demand. And don't forget, you're seeing the local Europeans slow down also. What do you make of the buy now, pay later? And we were hearing Good that it's question. actually picking up. Do you, buy, do you think that this is a positive sign for the retail world, or is it a negative sign that people are just basically turning to leverage? People are turning towards leverage. When buy now, pay later first came out, it was a huge event, a huge development, because it got younger people and, frankly, the millennials to spend. I think now that it's been around for a few years, if they can't pay on time, they're willing to delay and, frankly, be able to extend what their payment terms are. Is it changing charge cards? I mean, is buy now, pay later changing the charge card business? Not what we've seen. It, yeah. it didn't take off tremendously. It took off with a certain mm -hmm. demographic. And those are the millennials. Single best buy, go. I think that it's going to be TJX. I think TJX yeah, is going to be the TJX. winner for holiday in 2024. Dana, thank you for the brief. Dana Telsey with the Telsey Advisory Group here on the state. We pretty much covered it all there from TJX and Dollar General out to Gucci and Louis Vuitton. We really, you know, People trading it. down.
people lever, levering up. We're in the middle of the pain, which raises this question of, okay, does that mean that companies are going to hunker down and it's going to lead to less disinflation in some ways because they don't want to order more. I mean, to me, the inventory story is one of the biggest ones. They don't want to order more that they can't sell. It's just the pulse of America. This is what we do. We, we, you know, we spend money. You get a wage increase off of less inflation, and most of America celebrates that and goes out and spends it. They buy a refrigerator they don't need. That's what the, that's what happens, Watch right? Watch it, Tom. How was that refrigerator? Watch it. It's fine. It it's stored good. the overcooked Brussels sprouts well. <laughs> it did a great <laughs> job. So I can reheat them and cook them some more. Just kill them. Consumption at the Bramo House. Forget about Gucci. She bought a refrigerator. Features negative four. Pretty much an improvement there off of a softer tape uh, earlier. Much more uh, going on. Dollar fractionally weaker euro 109.51 please stay with us on radio and television this is bloomberg surveillance Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Kane. Mr. Farrell, in deep preparation for the 9 o'clock hour data. we got such an important guest. I want to get through the data quickly here. Improving negative 4 SPX, a VIX 13.07 after a stunning sub-13 VIX on Friday. Oil 75.13 the barrel. Not much going on as we await auctions. Lisa, what's the auctions? Are they today? We have auctions today. We've yes. got a two-year and a five-year, and tomorrow we've got <clears throat> seven-year Will they be auctions. movers? They might be movers. We shall see. But some other things that are moving, do you like that? I Very really nice. uh, have watched the online retailers to figure out just how much people are focused on them being the disproportionate winners during this holiday shopping season. So I wanted to take a look at Etsy, Shopify, Amazon, <clears throat> all shares popping higher. Etsy higher by 1.6%. Oh, uh, Amazon by 1.1%. <clears throat> Shopify up by 3%. 0.9% after uh, they set a Black Friday record, a 22% uh, increase in merchant sales. Again, I think that there is a really important focus here. How much is the gain here purely online versus overall in sales? Because what we saw from Adobe was, yes, a 7.5% increase well, in total online sales. <clears throat> but if you take a look at the MasterCard spending pulse, it was up only 2.5%. So it is not necessarily correlated across all of the different measures if you're looking right. outside of just online And sales. I look at shareholder total return of traditional stores. I looked at Nordstrom carefully. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday last week week. And it's basically a 10-year train wreck. So there's got to be winners there. As Dana Telsey said, her winners, TJ Maxx, TJX, I think is a symbol. Uh, you know, it, there's some real nuances here of stock selection among traditional retail winners. And from a broader macro perspective, <clears throat> how do you put this together to understand just how much more spending the consumer has in them after a lot of glut of spending over the past few years? Program note, next week, John Farrow, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen. Massive road trip. We got we to go, you know, I may have to go below 59th Street. <laughs> it's going to be wild. On this. Apollo, looking forward to this. Some worthies here. A guy named Torsten Slack, a guy named Rowan, Apple CEO, and Jim Zelter, who we spoke to in London. Lisa, what's your number one question to the leadership of Apollo? I'm curious going forward how they see, honestly, private markets or private uh, buyers really taking over for public markets in a new way and how much that's buffered right. some of the rate shock that we otherwise would have experienced. I want to know how deep the shadows are. We will see on that an important set of conversations at Apollo. And we front run that this morning with Torsten Slack. He's chief economist at Apollo Global Management and writes a piercing short note each morning. And here he harkens back to the skeletons in the closet, the worries that those older have about is this time like, well, try 1972, is this time like a nifty 50 or the point where Polaroid and Xerox were one of the five magnificent five uh, that were out there. Dr. Slack joins us this morning. I loved the, the equal multiples now with 1972. I believe that ended ugly. Do you take that over to an analog that this will end ugly? Well, we still, of course, have to wait and see exactly how AI will be used. And no one really knows how it will be implemented and how much productivity we'll get out of it or how much more consumption or welfare overall. But the bottom line really is what we can track is the valuations. 
And what I did write in the note today is exactly that the valuations and the trajectory is beginning to look uh, quite similar, including the levels we're at with the PE <coughs> for AI stocks or the Magnificent 7 now at above 50 on a trailing basis. It does make you wonder a little bit whether this is indeed uh, going to have a different story compared to what we've seen before or whether this is actually going to be similar in some way. I ways. mentioned Tom Galvin years ago at Donaldson Lufkin Genrata was very top line sales specific. Are we going to have the nominal GDP to support the Magnificent Seven, even if they level out, or to bring the breadth up in a good market? Well, the problem is that the S&P 493 has basically been flat for the last year. So the conclusion is that so far, all the market gains have been driven by this handful of stocks. So that, of course, also should bring us all to the discussion, OK, is this sustainable? To what degree is this something that is a good representation of the overall index? If you really end up just buying into one simple story, namely AI. Which is the reason why a lot of people are focused on the consumer to understand exactly where we are in this spending picture. And I want to go back to what we really began with, this idea of are we seeing sustained sales and a sustained strong consumer, or are we just seeing these shifts underway, regardless of who ends up benefiting the most, but shifts underway that represent strength in pockets, but not in the overall picture? Yeah, and I, absolutely. I do think that it is clear that the shifts have been towards services. So that's why goods have generally been slowing down. And Another strength point, as you're pointing out, is that we have also seen strength in online. But if you really back up and look at the data for how is the consumer doing, well, we just heard your previous guest talk about trading down. If you look at the linguage rates for auto loans have been going up, the linguage rates for credit cards have been going up. We're seeing across the board the level of interest rates are beginning to bite harder and harder and harder on consumers. So the conclusion, of course, is that the Fed is actually achieving exactly what the textbook would have predicted. Namely, the slowdown might not have been as fast as we all thought just a few quarters ago, but it is still playing out. The slowdown is here and it will continue. We still have the worst ahead of us. It is the case that monetary policy is biting continuously also going forward. What's the distance between Goldilocks and a full-blown recession? Well, the runway that we are on here for slowing the economy down from a Fed perspective certainly is that inflation is coming down. The labor market is also gradually coming down. And we've got to get a soft landing not only in inflation, but also the labor market. But we're beginning to see the unemployment rate has gone up from 3.4 to now 3.9. That's created a lot of discussion about the SAM rule and to what degree that's an indicator of a recession or not. But the conclusion to your question, Lisa, is I do think that we should view this in the broader context of what is it the Fed is trying to do. And the Fed is trying to slow the economy down. That's why they raise interest rates. They raise interest rates because they want us to buy fewer cars, fewer washers, fewer refrigerators, less furniture, fewer iPhones. And because of that, we should over time continue to see that process play out. There is a real tension right now, and I see this under the notes, underpinning the notes, calling for 5,000 or 5,100 on the S&P by the end of next year, which is how the Fed will respond to the slowdown that they wrought, that they wanted to see. Will they cut rates aggressively just simply because they're tightening the screws at a fast pace as growth slows. Do you buy that they will do that even if it keeps perhaps uh, the economy afloat and, and prolongs this period of disinflation? Yeah, this is a really important discussion. In, teams in Tom's language, we are looking at the Taylor rule. How much weight do they put on inflation? How much weight do they put on the labor market? So far, all the weight has almost entirely been on inflation. And the question is, next year, once inflation does get closer to two, will they begin to shift their attention over towards the labor market? In other words, are the coefficients changing so that we put more weight on the labor market now that the labor market is beginning to show some signs of weakening. I appreciate that jobless claims are not slowing, but the work week is coming down. If you look at job openings, is right. coming down. A number of indicators are suggesting that labor demand is weakening. So I do think that they will begin to shift away from focusing purely on inflation to begin to focus also okay. more on the labor well, market. Well, on the slack rule, this is like the Taylor rule. I'm inventing it right now, folks. The slack <laughs> rule. Look for this. The slack rule is a three-month moving average in non-farm payrolls. What statistic do we need on a three-month moving average of non-farm payrolls where we make the great tailor to slack shift? See, if you look at your latest number for non-farm payrolls, it was 150,000. If Surveys I type 188, 200. And if I type ECO Go on Bloomberg, I will see that by second quarter of next year, non-farm payrolls will, on average, for April, May, and June, be 35,000. So now you start wondering, 35,000, so now you start wondering, that's the average, so that can have some fluctuation. Now you start wondering, how is the S&P going to trade if we get 35,000 in non-farm payrolls? What if it even goes below zero? The risk is here that we may have a runway and the lack of effects of monetary policy essentially beginning to be a bigger drag on growth. Adobe, just out. Amy, thank you so much for this. This is Bramo spending this weekend. 
Adobe, a $12 billion to $12.4 billion Cyber Monday spend last year was $11.3 billion. But to your distinction, that's cyber. That's just we're parsing out how all of us are glued to Amazon. And it's Cyber Monday today, let alone all the other spending that we've <clears> seen <throat> over this period of time. Really, I mean, honestly, the, the distortions have been incredibly difficult to really pick up on, which is the reason why I'm listening to what you're saying, Torsten. This idea of the labor market weakening and the Fed maybe responding to that. And I'm thinking about, well, people still have money to spend. Their real wages are actually going up. And oh yeah, this is a job full recession that people are expecting. Jobful. This is what they say, right? That people are we're hoarding labor. This is a new world. Do you push back against that? Well, there is in your weekend reading from the Fed, the working papers that write about this, there is some debate between the Boston Fed, the San Francisco Fed, the New York Fed has also written about this, the Board of Governors has also written about this. The key issue still is, it's very clear that we are ultimately running out of savings, or excess savings in the household sector. The question is, some people view that has already happened, others view that's about now, others view that may only happen in the next few quarters. But the trend is very clear. The Fed is getting <coughs> what they want. They want a slowdown, and that's why you will ultimately get excess savings running out. And let's not forget student loan payments started on the 1st of October. That's why retail sales for October was relatively weak. If we put all these things together, I still think that the slowdown continues. Deutsche Bank put out a forecast for 175 basis points of Fed rate cuts next year. Is that feasible with the, with the recipe that you just put out there? Well, that does require, of course, a, quite a hard slowdown in the economy. That certainly requires a recession and a hard landing. The question is, that's right. not what the consensus is expecting at the moment. Uh, but it's clear that if we do get a sharper slowdown, and right. that is also what the consensus is expecting, it's just above zero. DB is expecting it below zero. Both scenarios make sense on their own, but the conclusion still is we still have more downside risk from where we are at the moment. I got to go back to your day job a couple of years ago before you got this easy slog with Apollo, and that was with Deutsche Bank. Rishi Sunak, the prime minister, told our Francine Lacroix adamantly he is not prescribing austerity. You and Volkerts Landau live this at Deutsche Bank of the continent of Europe and of the United Kingdom. Is there a risk they slip into an incorrect austere policy? Well, the problem is that both the UK and Europe have some same list of problems as the US, broadly speaking, and then they have some additional problems. But we problems. did stimulus. We did a lock-in New World stimulus. They're stuck in the old world. Is it that simple? Well, in some sense, fiscal policy is certainly very different in the US. It was much more aggressive than what it was in the UK and Europe. And in that sense, all the rules that, in particular, the growth and stability plan in Europe, but also in the UK, have certainly played a very critical role in why fiscal policy has been very different in the UK relative to the US. But fiscal policy will be more expansive than perhaps some people would say, given where rates are. That's what we saw from Germany and the recent prognostications over there. Do you think auctions matter? I do think auctions matter a lot. And as you know, <clears throat> as you just talked about, two-year, three-year, five-year and seven-year this week is very important. And if you go also and look at the auction sizes over the last several months, they have gone up. And as they continue to go up, the risk really here is that short rates may eventually come down. But we may have a steepener because long rates may potentially not come down as much because now we are dealing with this supply issue that potentially could put upward pressure and limit how much of a decline we can get in long rates. Let's revisit a banner from two hours ago, outnumbered again. Pharaoh gone, slack here, auctions matter too, no one cares one. I'm I think, I think we were at two before, now I think we're at three. Yeah, you know. I, I'm just I, saying. It's just, so it's like three to one is how we're going to take that. In. They matter. It depends if you care. I care. Well, I there think was that a 30-year auction a few weeks ago that mattered quite a lot. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you, Dr. Slack. It's good <laughs> if you have. Please stick around. Remind me of that. Torsten, go away at least till next week. <laughs> no. We've got a wonderful event we're going to be doing with Mark Rowan, of course. He's the host for us. As we visit Apollo, there are so many themes to take on here with Rowan. Zelter and, of course, Torsten Slack will join. I can't say enough about this event. Look for that. December 5-ish. Futures now negative 6. Futures uh, a negative 2%. To me, I, this to me is going to be one of the more interesting aspects, which is given the fact that you have countries that don't want to go back to austerity but have made their, their people accustomed to a lot of spending. I how do you end up getting benchmark rates back down to anything akin to what we got used to pre-pandemic? 
I'm not sure how we put these two things together unless right. spending comes down and then you're looking at a much harder landing. It's, to me, it's hugely cultural. It's something I learned from Focus Landau with all his good research uh, with Garber and, and uh, uh, Dooley. But the bottom, the bottom line here to me is a cultural difference here and the major cultural difference is Americans spend like drunken sailors. But to me, Germany doesn't, right? <clears throat> They're the ones that say we need to balance our books. We need yeah, to make sure everything is in the black. That right but that's changing, right? Yeah. And the, to me, this really highlights that policy of austerity failed. What's the happy medium in between at a time of rising carbon costs? I, I would also look to the United Kingdom um, as well. I think that's going to be interesting. I said negative 2%. SPX down two tenths of a percent. All of six points here as well. Coming up next, our friends in Lacroix at a summit in a Tudor castle with the United Kingdom Prime Minister Rishi Sunak looking for that. Uh, in a moment, uh, the Prime Minister does address austerity. Please stay with us. An austere Lisa Abramowitz <laughs> and Tom Keene. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back. Tom Keen, Lisa Bromwitz, John Fair is off to his next hour, and we are looking at a bit of a soggier market. Uh, just a touch, basically sleepy, trying to get back to the office after the tryptophanic uh, slumber of the weekend. Boy, did I live it. Friday, I was numb. This is not good. I'm glad it's, at the minimum, I'm glad it's once a year. <laughs> But I got slammed. I mean, I had the turkey salad thing going, and then why not have another? Yeah, yeah. What well, a that's mistake that often was. Often how it works on Thanksgiving. <clears throat> We're talking about how to create maybe a bit of a cutback after all of the Thanksgiving uh, sort of deluxe. And that has definitely been the conversation globally in a lot of developed markets. You can Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, the latest, saying that austerity in the UK, not on his agenda, telling Francine's, uh, Francine Lacroix of Bloomberg, the UK economy is grow showing signs of growth momentum. I've been Prime Minister for just over a year. During that time, we've halved inflation, as I said we would do. We've known now that the UK economy has recovered faster from the pandemic than pretty much any other major European economy. And over the long term, we're still forecast to outperform major European economies. Um, but crucially, business investment has grown faster than any other G7 economy over the last few years. And I think ultimately, if you want to drive growth and productivity in an economy, you need businesses to be investing. We have more momentum for business investment here than anywhere else. So look, I, I feel actually very positive about the long-term growth outlook for the UK. So do you think the OBR is actually going to have to revise them upwards? Are you confident that the numbers will come in so that you can continue cutting tax? What I can tell you is that when I became Prime Minister just over a year ago, not just the OBR, but also the Bank of England, the OECD and the IMF, all of them predicted that the UK would be in recession this year. That hasn't happened. We, we put in place a set of policies to ensure that it didn't, and I'm delighted the UK economy has outperformed all of those and has grown this year better than anybody thought. So, look, I've got a track record in outperforming what people think, and the, as I said, the UK economy has real momentum now. Inflation has been halved. Business investment is growing faster than elsewhere. And, and as I said, we've got commitments totaling almost £30 billion for our summit, it's significantly more than we've had in the past. So I think that shows that investors and companies are voting uh, with, their, with, their, with their pounds and their dollars, and that shows that there is confidence in the economy. And that's what makes me think we're poised for strong growth. But, Prime Minister, if you look at inflation, if you actually exclude energy, it's about, you know, been uh, down by, like, a fifth. So I don't know how much credit the government can actually take on that. Well, actually, if you look at core inflation, it's uh, pretty much middle of the pack for European economies, uh, forecast next year to be lower than the eurozone. And I think in the US, the last numbers I checked. So actually, the momentum on inflation is downwards and coming down faster than peers over the course of the next 12 months, if you look at the forecast. Um, and we're making sure that we are disciplined with borrowing, like ultimately what investors are looking at to make sure that fiscal policy is sensible. We're not fueling the inflationary fire. We're being sensible on public sector wage settlements. Uh, and actually, you're seeing that feed through to the economy. And as I said, we're also improving labor supply. If I talk to businesses, you know, what they're keen to see is access to labor. We're making sure right. that our labor market uh, remains flexible, that we're moving people off welfare and into work. Uh, all of those things are contributing to, I think, downward momentum on inflation. But Prime Minister, if the OBR is actually right in their forecast, what does it mean where you can actually find some spending freeze or actually cuts? 
Well, what we've just delivered are significant tax cuts. Significant tax cuts for business, significant tax cuts for everybody in work. That's what our autumn statement last week did. Uh, the biggest tax cuts in one event since the 1980s, just to give people a sense of scale. For business, what we're doing is making full expensing permanent. So we will be the only major G7 economy, certainly, and even broader than that, where you get a total write-off against your taxes for capital investment. That's an incredibly generous regime to attract business investment. And it comes on top of the fact that our corporation tax rate here is lower than any other G7 economy. And when it comes to individuals in work, we've just delivered a very significant personal tax cut that will put £450 extra uh, in, in the bank accounts of a typical person in work over the next 12 months, which will also be Prime good Minister, for consumption as well. That, that you have to find money in, for example, departments where you know that voters actually want you to spend more in certain departments. So are you comfortable as, as you know, possibly being Prime Minister of Austerity? No, that's simply not the case. Actually, government spending in the UK right now is at very high levels. Historically, over this parliament, it's grown at very high levels, even in real terms after the impact of inflation. So I think any a commentary or accusation that that's what's happening is just simply unfounded. And we're at a point now, given how people are feeling, given the amount that's being spent, where I think the priority has got to be lowering the tax burden. Right? Government's already spending a lot of people's money. And what we need to see going forward is more productivity out of the public sector. It needs to match what we've seen in the private sector post-COVID. And I'd rather focus on efficiency in the public sector and prioritise cutting people's taxes rather than the government spending ever more of their money. That's the point, I think, and I'm very clear that that is the choice that we are making. He is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Rishi Sunak, a piercing discussion there on austerity and the view forward, obviously his optimism forward of his United Kingdom. That conversation with Francine Lacroix, she joins us now on the edge of Tudor Court, Hampton Court Palace for a soiree of business and optimism and good feeling. Francine, let me cut to the domestic politics. How alone is the Prime Minister now within the fractious debate of the future of the United Kingdom? Hi, Tom. I have to say, it really crystallized those 10 minutes I had with the Prime Minister yesterday at Downing Street ahead of the Global Investment Summit kind of crystallized in my eyes how alone he really was. Because no matter what you asked him, he was trying to think quickly to see who he would not upset with his answer. So you're right, he has a very fractious Tory party that he's trying to keep together, uh, some asking for even more tax cuts than he's already delivered. At the same time, he has to keep investors on side to try to make sure that they're here. Um, we did have a lot of American bankers, so he's trying to attract, and he actually announced today, some uh, 29.5 billion pounds. But he's also, of course, very far below in the polls. He's about 20 points behind the Labour uh, Party. Party, and he needs to call it an election by January 2025. So it's complicated. And he, he, I felt he was quite alone. Do you think that he's convincing businesses that he can both cut taxes, but also not sort of foist an air of austerity on a nation that has gotten used to a greater, uh, significant, significantly more spending? So I think for the moment, Lisa, and good morning to you as well, he's, he's been, you know, towing a very fine line. And actually, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, did it with a lot of ability last week. So what they announced in the autumn uh, statement, which is almost like a mini budget, was the fact that they were cutting taxes, but they weren't changing the tax bans, which means that you can cut taxes, but because of inflation, mm -hmm. you actually earn a little bit more. And so you pay the same amount of tax or uh, at the margin even a, a little little bit more tax, although he says he's cutting taxes. So because of that, the OBR found a lot more money that he could play with. Um, this money we heard from the fiscal watchdog says, look, even if you continue cutting taxes at some point, you'll have to do, you know, cut down on government spending in certain departments. Now, what I tried to get from him is it the NHS, is it these departments that voters will see and therefore vote for Labour because they don't want some of these cuts. So it's quite, of course, very delicate. And he certainly pushed right. back against the austerity word because it's, right. it's very loaded. Francine, very quickly here, and you're expert on this, the autocracy, the conservative bent of Eastern Europe, we now see over the weekend the shock of the Netherlands. Is autocracy tilt, is conservative tilt coming to the United Kingdom? 
Tom, this is a very delicate question because it was only two weeks ago that the Prime Minister also uh, changed his cabinet to have someone who's much more moderate uh, in charge of domestic affairs. So he got rid of Suela Beverman, who really enticed anti-immigration sentiment. Now, we're not talking anything like what happened in the Netherlands, but this is, again, a country that voted for Brexit, so it has to deliver on, of course, cutting down illegal immigration, hence the question on Rwanda on the small boats want at the same time need to make sure that people still want to come and work mm -hmm. here. So I don't know if there's an influence from the UK, but it, they need to tread this very carefully. Francine, thank you so much. Francine Lacroix from Hampton Court, an important conference of the United uh, Kingdom. Of course, look for her early, 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 early in the American morning is how I would put that. Way, way early. You asked a great question <clears throat> about sort of the uh, more extreme factions, the autocratic tendencies that you're talking about. Fascinated by it. It is really interesting and to see. And it was in the U.S. press this weekend, too, about in America. In terms of, of in, and, well, it was, yes, about America, but also, you know, Netherlands, you've got Argentina, you have <clears throat> a real shift yeah. toward the polls. In the U.S., I wonder, if you didn't have the primary system that we did, would you have a very different pool of potential candidates oh, for yeah, this absolutely. election. You wonder if you'd have a parliamentary vote where 30 percent wins. I mean, there's some countries like that. I mean, it, it really speaks to what we're going to see here to the end of the year and certainly into the election year, the many elections year of 2024. The VIX 13.06, the uh, SPX negative seven. I'm looking at the two year yield, 4.93 percent. The auction. Stay right? with us for complete team coverage of the auctions. We'll be doing that through the day. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.